So let me tell you something, <coughs> uh, some updates uh, from uh, from the last uh, DEF CONF, and also something which I'm working on right now, and what uh, is planned for the future, basically. Uh, the subject is uh, TC classifier action subsystem. Uh, so uh, the biggest changes, the biggest change in this subsystem from uh, from last uh, NEDEF uh, is the support for multi chains, and uh, you can see some example of how you can actually do that. So here in this example, I just create Ingress Q disk. And into this QDisk, I insert uh, one flower uh, filter. And the action, as you can see here, is go to chain one. And that means that whenever the filter is hit, uh, the action will just re redirect it to, the, to, to chain one. And then I can, uh, um, I can insert some uh, rules or some filters into chain one. So you can see everything is the same as uh, in the first line. The only difference is that I specify chain one here, and that's it. You can have like I don't know, what's the limit? Limit is U32 for the chain, basically. So it's basically unlimited. So uh, here you can see. Yeah, I, was, I wanted just to show how it works, uh, how it worked previously, and how it works now. So how it works, uh, how it worked previously is you have a Q disk, then ha you have a chain, and inside this chain there are a couple of TPs. Uh, and every TP has a list of filters uh, which, are, which are processed. So now with the multi-chain, you have this basically. So still you always, the, the, the packet processing starts from, uh, from, the first, uh, from the chain zero, always. And then if a particular uh, filter is hit and uh, action is executed, it can uh, jump to another chains. So here's another jump. Nice picture, right? It's <laughs> very nice. <laughs> OK. Um, there are a couple other changes since uh, last NetDev. Uh, we added a uh, couple of uh, matches into flower classifier, uh, particularly MPLS, um, uh, MPLS fields matching. Uh, also TCP flex matching and also IP TOS and TTL matching. It's like these two are really small patches. This is a little bit bigger, but also quite small. Uh, another thing which we added is uh, trap uh, action. What we use it for is whenever. Well, basically this this is useful only for offloading, because if you have. Uh, uh, if you have uh, packets flowing uh, through the through the hardware, and you don't s actually see the packets on the CPU, you may be interested in some particular packet. So you insert a rule which will eject the packet up to the CPU so it can see it. So here, that's so the, that's you is Dell. Did you intentionally want to say Dell there, or you want to say add? That is oh yeah, <laughs> 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 I want to say add. Sorry, yeah. <coughs> Uh, okay, and uh, uh, co with, with these changes which I mentioned, there are also uh, related changes in MLXSW driver, which is driver for our spectrum switch. And basically we, had, we added uh, offloading for most of the mentioned things. Well, all of them except for the MPLS. We don't support that yet, but it's on the plan. Uh, also, we added uh, we added on top of the of top of the changes we added support for OK termination action. Well, it's very trivial. Okay, so what I'm working on right now is the shared blocks, and basically the the idea is to allow users to sh to define blocks which would be shared among the QDisk. So basically you would have one block uh, which defines a lot of filters and chains and whatever. And then you have uh, like 30 net devices and they will all point to this one particular block. Uh, why? Of course we want to reduce memory footprint. Uh, 
it's easier for a user perhaps not to duplicate the work and to fill up all uh, the filters for all the net devices. He just do it once and that's it. And also, our ma main motivation is uh, to do it for offload use case when we need to uh, optimize the, the utilization of uh, hardware resources, like TCAM, for example. Uh, this took me a lot more than I expected originally, mainly because of the removal of TPQ. It's a very tricky one. There are a lot of places where it, this is, well, not, not now. Now it's only one place. I removed that all, like the other ones. Uh, but, oh yeah, it's still, this, this is this is weird, right? I removed, uh, I did a couple of patch sets and I removed all the uses of TPQ. And n last week, Jakub inserted a patch which added another use of TPQ. So now I have to remove it again. And it will be a little bit trickier, trickier than the than the other one. So yeah, it's it's fun. Hopefully, no one else will add another TPQ. That would be uh, not good for me. Okay, and. Um, yeah, all the preparations are merged uh, currently in that next git. Um, and uh, I have uh, in my queue uh, prepared MLXSW offloading for, for this particular feature. So I just want to illustrate how it works, uh, sharing of the blocks. So this is current situation when you have three net devices. Each net device has a key disk attached and then you have a block with change filters and actions. And voila. Here, it points to the... It's, it, it looks really simple, right? But it's now perhaps uh, four or five months since I started to work on that. It's not that trivial to implement, actually. But in this case, the, the So, so just in, the, in this case, w w w where you say the block, it's in the software, but it, uh, someone also also in the hardware, in the TCAM, right? Yeah, it so, uh, right. So, it so in this case, thing. in this case, the TCAM ACL does not match on the um, on the ingress port, or you can match if it's one, two, or three, but not four or five. How do? You well, you can specify the match inside the inside the rule itself. It doesn't necessarily has to be specified by attaching it to... Yes, 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 yes. I'm just asking in, in the hardware. Yes. Let's say in this case you want it on, on 0, 1, and 2, but you don't want it on, four and on 3 and 4. So in, in the TCAM itself, you, 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 you totally wildcard the port, or you... It's up to you. It's up to you as a user how, to, how, to how you want to configure it. So you can avoid the matching on in, in ingress ports. No, but when you offload it, it's, it's yeah. you, you have to decide the driver. It's not the user. No. Oh. <laughs> I'm just asking, I'm not... So, so, so in, in most of the hardware, I don't need that package. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there are a lot of hardware in which there, there, are, there is a concept of binding. So this is equivalent to the binding concept. So it's, it's not related to the match itself, it is related to the binding. Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, here on this slide, you can uh, actually see the usage of uh, sharing the block. I don't want to break anything. Okay, all right, that's all right. Uh, so here you can see uh, I created. Oh, that's that's not better. <laughs> All right. So here you can see uh, I add ingress a Q disk to ETH0, ETH1, and ETH2. Uh, the changes that I can specify block uh, block 22, which identifies the block. So I, c I can use any number, uh, or I can I can actually create the first one, and then I can just list Q disks. Block ID will be assigned to that. I can use this, the uh, assigned uh, block ID, basically, but it's 
It's also up to the user. For, for if you want it, this to be done in a script, it's, it's better to do it this way, of course. <coughs> Here you can see the list. It's there with block 22. And then if you add uh, a filter uh, to, oh, sh here, here it should be ETH0. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> I, I copy pasted and edited it a little bit. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can, you can actually use ETH0, ETH1, ETH2. It doesn't really matter. It inserts the, the filter into the block, which is shared. So. Um, also, you can use uh, CLS Act if you want ingress and egress. And just you, want, you need to specify ingress block and egress block, which could be the same. Could be different. It's up to you. Okay, and it's my last slide. Uh, this should give us, this, this should be actually something which we can discuss a little bit, perhaps. Uh, if you have some ideas, that would be good. Uh, the, the, the need is that we need, uh, the, the problem is that we need uh, some hinting for offloading. And uh, there are two groups of hinting we need. We need some how to <coughs> hint driver about the match keys. So it's a, it's a, pro it's a little bit problematic because when we allocate TCAM regions inside the hardware, we have to define uh, the keys which will be used, uh, I mean, the, the match keys which will be used inside uh, the, this TCAM region. And uh, it's hard to predict what the user will insert as a rule in future. So now we try to be, like, we try to allocate as much match keys as possible but it's a waste of resource because when user inserts only some particular match keys or rules with some particular match keys, uh, it's like it's not really needed to allocate for all of them, and we would save a lot of space. Uh, so user knows probably what he's going to insert, and he may provide us some some hints about that so we can prepare for it and optimize it. And uh, something similar with the, with the filter max count, uh, we would also be happy if user will say to us, hey, I want this table to be of size 100 entries, for example, so we can prepare for it and, uh, and optimize the resource utilization, basically. So, uh, but I really don't know how to manage this because, for example, for match keys hinting, when you look at the chain, when it, how it is done in TC, each chain, uh, each, each member of the chain, each TP could be of different classifier types, so we can have mixture of uh, flower, U32, whatever else classifier, and we need the hint to be generic for all the chain. So we can perhaps somehow share a state between these TPs. Like it is it is done now with U32. It's a it's an ugly hack. I don't really want to do it for other classifiers as well. But that's possible, I guess. Mm. Ah, we'll see. a very big topic, right? It's the about resource allocation. Uh, no? It, well, about how much space you have. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just want to emphasize we are having the same kind of problems and so we definitely need a, we definitely need a solution um, in both cases. Yeah. Okay. When are you leaving? When are you taking off? Tomorrow, you? Tomorrow, yeah. Uh, can we meet tomorrow? In the morning. <laughs> Anybody else interested that's going to be there? We don't. We don't have time, unfortunately. We could go for a whole day. Yeah, you know, and I. It could also go on the, on the mailing list or after the. Uh, I we, we really I really can't give you more time. Okay. I know it's an important topic. Yeah. But I got tons of people lined up for this.
Iya. That's right. So, so other than this, do you have any questions regarding what I just? Anybody wants to ask a quick question? If you can explain again the last two lines. Uh, uh, can you? If you can quickly explain the last two lines in the this line. Yeah. This one? Yes. Yeah. So, well, I either can uh, for for classification and actions, the easiest QDisk which you can use is Ingress QDisk or CLS Act which is basically ingress qdisk but also for egress oh it it shares this it's 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 the same c file basically right so you have the same abilities you want to do for ingress but on the egress side as well it was added by daniel workman some a year, a year ago something like that yeah it's actually pretty interesting i use it too yeah i'm sorry Yuri, i'm gonna put you off there all right uh, you, yeah. all right so my my goal here uh, is to uh, give everybody a little background about what time-sensitive networking is uh, and to get some feedback on some existing uh, TSN-related TC features and suggestions on the best approaches for further features. Um, so there's been uh, some discussion on the NetDev mailing list lately about how to get some of these features into the kernel. There's a lot of uh, sort of out of tree drivers and things like that to uh, support some uh, time sensitive networking features in different contexts. And uh, there's a move to get some of that support into the kernel in a way that makes everybody happy. So I want to uh, help coordinate that effort. And uh, uh, part of the, the reason is I, I've, uh, one of the maintainers of the open avenue repository that's doing the user space portion in Linux of uh, time sensitive networking support. So it's all open source and uh, designed to get everybody collaborating and just get all the plumbing in one spot so we don't have a whole bunch of disorganized, unrelated, out of tree drivers. Next. Next. Okay, so time-sensitive networking comes from the uh, IEEE 802.1 standards task group of the same name. There's a whole bunch of standards, something like 12 or 13 of them now, that uh, are all kind of geared around the same thing, which is to provide uh, bounded worst-case delays. So, uh, you know, when you have best effort traffic, this is really the best policy for most network traffic, but there are certain use cases where you need uh, bounds that you can rely on. And uh, with uh, time sensitive networking, you can have, you know, get rid of the long tail of uh, best effort traffic and have reliable bounds. And also, uh, there's a lot of applications that have uh, time synchronization requirements where your user level protocols need to have things happening at specific times that are coordinated across devices in the network. Things like uh, audio video synchronization, things like uh, machine control, uh, automotive networks where you're uh, controlling brakes and cruise control and uh, getting uh, driver assistance feedback. These are all areas where uh, people are trying to converge their networks onto ethernet or uh, similar uh, variants of ethernet. And uh, they have a need for bounded latency and time sync. So the way we do this is we provide global time sync, we provide resource reservation and access control because you can't provide guarantees without being able to say no to uh, traffic that would defeat your uh, attempts to provide the guarantees. And then uh, the final mechanism, which is most important to the, the TC subsystem is traffic shaping and scheduling. So basically we have a, a protocol called GPTP based on IEEE 1588 PTP. Uh, it ensures that uh, all the link peers can talk this time synchronization protocol. And then we have a stream reservation protocol that has a specific uh, <coughs> attribute that establishes the ability to reserve traffic. And uh, once you've established a domain, uh, talkers and listeners uh, talk to each other through the network and establish 
uh, reservations for bandwidth and uh, forwarding tables in the bridges along the path are updated to uh, support the uh, reserved bandwidth traffic. And once that's all in place, you can start actually streaming your traffic. Uh, the talkers transmit at regular intervals and they include timing information in the, in the traffic that they send in their streams. The, the bridges prioritize and shape the stream traffic so it all uh, gets forwarded through smoothly and the listener receives the traffic and can recover any timing related information that is necessary for what it's doing. So this is just a little illustration of what a, a time sensitive networking domain looks like. You can have uh, wireless links. This is a little bit weak right now. Uh, interfacing with the Wi-Fi Alliance to get uh, the specified protocols actually implemented is interesting. Uh, we have, <clears throat> you see there's a, a TSN capable endpoint here that's not in the domain because uh, he's connected through a hub which can't support the protocols. So he's cut out and over here there's a switch that doesn't support the, the necessary uh, reservation or time sync protocols and he's cut out too. So if anybody's looked at the 802.1Q standard for bridging, this might look familiar. The idea is uh, this is the model for how queuing and forwarding happens in bridges. Uh, selection algorithm here refers to uh, how the, how transmit selection here picks between multiple queues. And uh, these are, are colloquially known as shapers. Uh, the new thing here is uh, additional shapers and this gate feature here, which t provides uh, basically a TDM style access to the network where uh, different queues have time slices uh, during which they can use the network. This gives you uh, the lowest possible latency of uh, traffic through the network because when you time it and have that time aligned with the windows, it ensures that there is no interfering traffic and your traffic gets a smooth path all the way to its destination with very little uh, timing jitter. So uh, in Linux today, uh, there is not a lot of support, but again, not a lot is required actually. So what we have now uh, is mostly supporting the, the older protocols uh, that were known as uh, audio video bridging or AVB. And part of that, there's a layer two transport protocol for audio video formats. Um, <clears throat> So it sends 8,000 for class A or, or 4,000 yeah, 4, for class B traffic uh, packets per second through the network. And those all have to be spaced evenly. You can't bunch them uh, because that gets rid of the uh, ability to uh, guarantee the, the bounds on your latency. So <clears throat> actually providing the kernel, those packets spaced at that interval is very difficult, especially since a lot of these uh, devices, we're not talking about uh, 50 core machines. We've got maybe two ARM cores or something that uh, need to be uh, doing other things as well, like running a user interface for a, a, an automotive head unit or something. So anyway, that, that's one challenge that we have. Um, but uh, I've uh, experimented using the, the HTB shaper so that we can queue up a bunch of uh, these frames at once and have that shaper spread them out. And that has proved to be pretty effective, although uh, it's a little bit uneven sometimes when you're uh, talking about getting them spaced out at the uh, 125 microsecond intervals. Um, so the way that bridges recognize uh, time-sensitive networking traffic is that uh, it's always VLAN tagged and it always has uh, specific uh, priority code point assignments for the SR classes. SR is streaming reservation. So 
you have uh, the VLAN tag and then a unique multicast destination address per stream. Uh, there's some special configuration you have to do. Uh, you can't have any uh, a half duplex, you can't use pause frames, and you can't have any jumbo frames. Uh, because, you know, the larger your frames, the longer you can interfere with the time-sensitive traffic. And then there's a, a different uh, mapping of priority codes to traffic classes, which provides a little bit of confusion because we're elevating two and three to be the highest priority ones. And then uh, four, five, six, and seven are the next highest priority. So it's a little bit out of order, but those remain, you know, the, the same priorities for the strict priority queues. Okay, so recently uh, some engineers from Intel uh, provided a QDisc-based software shaper and the hardware offload for it. Uh, it implements the uh, credit-based shaping algorithm that's in the standards. Uh, currently, there's only I210 driver support, but there are a lot of other NICs in the kernel tree that are capable of this offload yet. Um, I'd like to uh, provide some patches that enable this uh, shaper offload in uh, those other NICs. Uh, one issue is that the credit-based shaper algorithm actually requires that you shape things also on a per stream basis, not just on a per cla traffic class basis, which is what the shaper provides. Uh, I've got an idea later for uh, a hierarchical shaper that will uh, take advantage of the, the same hardware offload, but also shape the streams. So there's another feature that was, uh, there's a recent RFC on the NetDev list from Richard Cochran. Uh, who uh, does the, the PTP uh, uh, subsystem in the kernel. Uh, he, re he proposed a general TX time C message from user space that you can put in your send message calls to schedule packet launch. And it would set a timestamp field in the SK buff. And there's uh, a number of NICs, including the I210 again, that will use that scheduled time as uh, and compare it to its PTP clock internally and launch it precisely at that time. This enables a lot of the, the TSN functionality described in the standards. But there's uh, a lot that is left to do on this to uh, get it fully uh, implemented and merged. We need to know what time scale we should associate the timestamps with where do we store the timestamp? We probably don't want a new field in uh, SKB. Uh, we need to know how to deal with out of order and already passed timestamps from the kernel. And uh, a way to integrate with the, the T packet, uh, the M map, and now the, the, zero, the zero copy. A question? This is the work that Richard posted, or it's, is it related? Uh, that, that was from uh, what Richard posted. Okay, because I was talking to some guys from Google and they say that they didn't accept it because there was no software fallback pass. That, that's the reason? Uh, he, it wasn't ex he wasn't expecting it, was, excuse it to me, be. It was, it, was, it was an RFC. Yes, it was rejected, excuse me, because there was no software fallback pass. Uh, he hasn't implemented it yet. It was just a request for comments on it. Okay. So and, and the hardware that you can do that is what's called the IGB. It's the one gig. It's the one gig. Uh, yes. The 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 I two ten. It's a flavor of IGB anyway. Yes. So so in your hardware, uh, a queue can can be non FIFA. Right. Because when you do time based, I want to send this now in one second from down. But now I want to send something earlier. Right. So the queue is not FIFA anymore. You, you support it. Good. Yeah, it, it gets blocked until that time arrives. The head of queue blocks until its timestamp arrives. But it I also think. blocks other queues, the lower priority queues. I'm, I'm cut you off. But so, sorry, we just right, out of time. Yeah. Uh, we, do we have more slides? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh,
How much time have I got? Nothing, basically. Do you, uh, do okay, uh, so... I'll, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll give you, like, pick the most important one, I'll let you talk about it. Okay, I, I've got a little bit more. Uh, some, these are the, the two things I've talked about now are sort of in progress. And I'd like to uh, talk with uh, people afterwards if you're interested. But uh, the, this is a, a, a function required for uh, later standards. I, I believe most of it could be implemented by existing TC features. I'm not sure, though. Uh, the idea is to uh, allow existing applications to use TSN features by rewriting their their so SKBs. So I'm just going to comment that the there's a talk going on in parallel right now about buffer of uh, Wi-Fi. It's the scheduling seems to be very similar to this, mm -hmm. right? In others, they have stations and then they have priorities. It's a hierarchical kind of thing. One is kind of by priority, and then at the lower level, you have by some sort of uh, scheduling algorithm that's specific to wireless. So from a general point of view, that may be a fit. Did you look at the Wi-Fi paper? Or I, I haven't, or you seen, haven't seen the Wi-Fi paper. And so unfortunately, uh, it's going in parallel. They yeah. were going to show up here and talk about their stuff, which they have similar challenges. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe it's good to sync up with them as well. Yeah, the, there's, there's a number of different schedulers that can be plugged in uh, to uh, these time-sensitive networking uh, protocols. Uh, I think most of them can be implemented through a combination of uh, software shapers uh, in the TC framework and this launch time functionality that, that we talked about, where you can uh, you know, let the queues go at specific times uh, based on assigned timestamps in uh, a, a queue disk. Do you trust the timestamp in software? Like, or do you? I, the, I, can the kernel put the timestamp? I would prefer the kernel to be putting the timestamps in, but in some cases, uh, uh, you need to uh, coordinate with applications. Applications say, I can transmit on this schedule at this offset from the, the standard cycle. And I, I think a software QDIS could take that schedule and it could be in charge of putting the timestamps into the frames as to uh, make them launch on that schedule. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, what, what I need from TC is this notion of a timestamp, the notion of scheduling when something is going to happen. That's, that's what doesn't exist yet. And I think just that, that one notion would enable a lot of software queue disks as well as offloads if to you have, the if you have a reference hardware timestamp. that can do it. If you have a reference timestamp, you can always um, schedule something to happen at X plus a diff of time, right? Right, exactly. So and, and that's how I think a lot of this would work. Okay. Uh, we just need to have uh, a way to have that timestamp that's not a timestamp that something happened. It's a timestamp that's scheduling something to happen. Yeah, I'm sorry that we don't have much time. But this so uh, there's a lot of extra important. information I put in the slides for people who are interested in TSN. So please download the slides afterwards. Uh, take a look if you're interested. And uh, my contact information is in the earlier slides, get in touch with me, and uh, I will be happy to spend uh, time explaining. So no more questions, please. But I, was, I thought you said driverless cars. Is that what you said? The, the time, this is used in some driverless? Uh, uh, not necessarily driverless cars, right. but uh, uh, cameras from cars right. feeding into uh, uh, machine learning things, recognizing. Uh, I see. Yeah, there's. Okay. Lots of different places it's being used. Okay, okay. A and uh, for some reason, when you said Herman, I thought you know you got this musicians lip syncing in K-pop, and the timing is important. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we originally uh, were doing uh, uh, whoever's next. You can J just come over wherever you're next on the schedule, which is. Uh, yeah, sorry, keep going. I just yeah. Uh, uh, Harmon's involvement was originally uh, in the pro audio space. But uh, it turns out that uh, the automotive infotainment is actually where a lot of our revenue comes from. And it's uh, one of the big reasons that we were purchased by Samsung. And so uh, that is where the, the primary action in the TSN space is. And uh, industrial networking people are also uh, a big player now. Thanks, Levi.
Okay, so this is the, the switch dev uh, infrastructure, okay, for the SRLV. Um, for in order to, to do TC flower offload into the internal, uh, so, so this is the NIC here, this is a two port NIC, right? Um, so uh, with uh, PF and this VF, another PF and, and, and this associated VF, um, so two port device. Uh, we have internal switch, but initially in the switch dev mode, um, nothing is offloaded yet. But we need the, the plumbing of the switch dev uh, infrastructure to tie everything together and then do the eventual offload. Okay, so, um, so initially our packets will f go through the software switch um, um, and, and it's, nothing is offloaded. Okay, so we have we create one VF representer for each VF, okay? So this is the VF representer that represents the VF so that we can, we can connect to the, to, the, to the switch. And we're using the PF to represent a port. And I understand from the last uh, few days that... Okay. So, so in, in, uh, in discussions in the last few days, I understand that the... Uh, the um, the consensus seems to be that we need to have representations for the for the port. Uh, so so current so, so we'll, we'll look into that. So but currently uh, we only have one representative for for each VF. Okay, and this represents the port. So for example, um, if we want okay, so ultimately we want this flow. Uh, let's say okay, ultimately for example this one, we want this one. Let's use this one, the, the red one, okay? Ultimately, we want this to go directly to port, port one, okay? And, and, and be offloaded and be, be fast. And so we would, um, we accept the TC, NDO uh, setup TC, okay? We accept NDO setup TC here and here and on the PFs, okay? So that way, for example, here we, uh, the user can insert a TC filter saying that, okay, if it matches on, on this flow, it may be an L2, maybe L3, um, and then we will redirect it to the, to the port, right? So that way, after we accept that and we download it successfully, then that TC uh, filter will now be, be inside a switch and it will switch it directly. Okay, yeah. The last one. It seems to only go in one direction. Okay, it goes all the way to the end and then have to go back. Okay, next one. Okay, so so this is before. Okay, so if we insert if we insert all the TC flower um, rules for all these different colored paths in the in the in the proper way, um, then it will be like this. Okay, so all the flows will now flow directly. This is again this is inside the NIC, the this internal switch inside the NIC, two port NIC. Then, um, then the flows will flow directly, okay, without going, going through the software switch. Um, so this, this diagram is, is a little bit inaccurate right now because this, in this diagram, we assume that this, this one switching domain, okay, we, we can switch flows uh, from any, any uh, VF to any VF, from any VF to any port, but actually in the current implementation, um, this, this part, okay, this PF and, and this VF, uh, and, and this one, they're, they're separate. They have two uh, switch, I think it's uh, the parent ID, I think it's called parent ID. They have, they have different parent ID, so we cannot, we won't accept a flow uh, to go from here to here, for example, the blue line. But, but eventually, we will make it so that 
they all um, will have the same parent ID and we can, we can do this. Okay. So, so that's, that's just a basic um, uh, infrastructure to accept the TC flower flows um, into the hardware. Okay, so all that implementation was done by my colleague, Satya Perla, okay. The code went upstream in July 2017, uh, a few months ago. Okay, so these are the current uh, TC flower classifier that we support, and they are all ingress. Uh, L2, VLANs, IPv4, IPv6, uh, L3, TCP, UDP, ICMP, VXLAN over IPv4, okay. And the, the TC actions are drop, redirect, push pop a VLAN, and in the, in the previous diagram, they're all redirect, for example, right? So in here, we're just doing all redirect um, to just get the, the SRLV switch um, uh, working, okay, for the, for all the VVMs, for all the VFs. Okay, so uh, in, in, in this slide, I'd like to just do a, a quick comparison between a TC flower implementation and the N tuple implementation that, we, that that was done much earlier. Okay, so TC flower is, is brand new. N tuple was uh, done about two years ago. Okay, and surprisingly, uh, there are quite a bit of um, similarities between the two. So, for example, um, they both use the dissector. Okay, um, for N tuple, we actually have to dissect the, the actual RX packet. In the, in the TC flower case, the TC subsystem already has already dissected um, the, the, the flow into a, into a flow key and passed down to the, to the driver. And, um, and I, I understand from, uh, from discussion in the last few days that uh, the, the people may have some regrets in using the, the, the dissector for the, for the TC subsystem uh, because it, it just makes it very difficult uh, to expand because now every time you touch the, t the dissector, it, uh, it touches a lot of, um, a lot of code that, that's using the dissector. But anyway, the way it is, today um, they both use uh, the dissector. Um, for the n-tuple case, okay, it's always an exact match, okay? Um, and for, for the TC flower, it's, it's much more um, flexible. Um, um, we can have uh, mask. We can have the the key. Ca the key can have mask, so that we can we can have um, uh, a wildcard match. It doesn't have to be exact match. It can be exact match, but it ca can also be wildcard match because you can specify the the mask. Um, in the case of the n tuple, is all the action is always just redirect to a ring. Okay, because that's what it's designed for. Uh, the the number of actions for TC flower is, is much much richer. Okay, you can do drop, redirect, push pop a VLAN, tunnel encapsulation, decapsulation. And that's that's what we support today. These are the actions we support today. And every TC flower um, filter that 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 we get from the TC subsystem we have to store it, right? Because um, you know, we, we may have to delete it later, we may have to change it later, uh, we may have to age it later. So, so we'll use the, I think this is the um, resizable, resizable hash table, the hash, we hash it multiple ways. Uh, TC gives us a cookie, uh, but we have to hash it in different ways so that we can search it. Uh, because some, some, of the, um, uh, some of the filter rules they use common um, handles, okay? So, so this is, um, it is a much more complicated uh, resizable hash um, system that we use, whereas for the n-tuple, it's just a simple hash using the RSS, RSS hash um, um, for, for, the, for the packet. Okay, so after we've offloaded a TC flower filter, okay, the, the switch, doesn't see it anymore. It doesn't see that packet anymore, right? Because it's now, it's now uh, switched by the hardware. So we have to maintain statistics, okay? So that, 
so that um, the um, upper layers can decide when to when to age the flow. In the case of n tuple, because we're just redirecting to a ring, software still sees the packet. Uh, we're not we're not keeping any any statistics. So, but but surprisingly, there's there's quite a bit of similarities between the two. Uh, of course, TC flower is much much more complicated. Um, so, but but. Unfortunately, because it's done by two, two different people, we, we're not sharing any code, but, uh, but there is um, opportunity that we can, we can share some code here. Okay, so um, future plans, uh, as I said. Okay, the future plan is to be able to switch across the whole ASIC. This is, this is a dual port NIC again. It's one ASIC, one chip. Uh, we want to be able to switch from any VM to any VM, from any, I'm sorry, from any, any VF to any VF, from any VF to, to any port, not just the, the natural port that it, it belongs to. So currently we, we don't do this yet, but we plan to do this uh, for the future. Yeah, the uplink representation that I talked about earlier, um, we don't have a we don't have a representative for the port, okay? Uh, only representative for the VF, so we probably will look into that, assuming that's the consensus. Um, the the actions we will do more actions. I think p-edit is a recently added action. Um, that's something we plan to add. P-edit means we we rewrite the header, okay? Um, given a match. Uh, we, we, can, we can do certain header rewrites. Um, as I said, because we need to um, keep statistics for the flows so that um, upper layers can, can decide how to age the flows, um, we, we need to improve on the statistics gathering. Right now, we just have a timer. We just go through all the flows. Uh, because it's kept in the firmware, right? The, the flow counters are kept in the firmware. So we have a timer that runs a, once a second, and we just go through the hash table and then get the latest uh, flow counters from, from the hardware, and it's, it's rather inefficient. So, so that, I think, um, um, we, ha we, can, we need to improve on that. And then the flow insertion rate, you know, uh, that's something we haven't measured yet. But, but it's, it's important that, that we be able to um, offload a flow very quickly, okay? Um, okay. Okay, I think that, that's all, that's all. Mm -hmm. uh, question? Uh, can I have you all come up bef because I have to transfer slides, but your slides are ready, so do you wanna go next? Any, any questions for uh, for uh, Michael? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, can I? Uh, yes, please. Um, how many flow can you support? And it's it depends on the on the classified so on the on, on what flow it is. Okay, if it's a simple L2, we can do more. Okay, if it is a L3 um, or, or or even VXLAN, then 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 it takes up it takes up internally. We use keys. Okay, so if it's a simple L2 key. We can we can support a lot more. Okay, but, but, but it's rough, roughly, what's it's in the number of thousands, thousands. thousands. Yeah, thousands of flows. Mm -hmm. so okay. L two L two more than L three L four. Okay, and you you said that you want to support header rewrite, but what about uh, VXLAN? You said you can classify, but VXLAN we do we, we do end cap de cap. Ah, you do end. Yeah, okay. End cap, so you didn't mention it. So you. Uh, so you I do. I think I did. Okay. I think I did. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's all. Uh, um, regarding, you, you, you also had a chart where you have multiple uplinks. So we also, uh, that was, yesterday we discussed many things, but that specific point. Mm -hmm. So would you have um, one binding point to manage the e-switch or two binding points? How would it work? Okay, so right now, any PF, okay. Are you talking about like... Like, like a P, yes. Like, like changing it from switch dev mode to... For instance, yes, yes, mode. So, yes. So currently, any PF can do that. Okay, okay? right. And... Um, Probably it will be better to have single entry point. Okay. Yeah, but currently 
It's, it's like one PF is, 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 is like its, its own domain right now. Right. Okay. And when, when your driver looks on the firmware, the, mm -hmm. the, the model they present to mm -hmm. the driver, it's that you have w one e-switch or two e-switches, how it works in your case? The hardware is one one e switch. It's one e switch for for the two parts. Yeah, yeah, but but of course we software can can that the model right now we look at it as okay, this part of the one side of the chip um, is is one domain, the other is one domain. But internally the switch the hardware is is one switch. Good, yeah. good for you. <laughs> <laughs> we have a problem there. We'll see what what we have to do. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Michael. Hi. Hi. So uh, that's uh, um, also from Melox, uh, but this is more of the activity on the, um, we have two groups, uh, two horses, uh, the gentleman from the switch, from the ASIC, and we're from the NIC, so that's the NIC side of thing. Page down, J Jamal. Uh, the arrow key, left, right. Excuse me? There's an arrow key there. This one? Yeah. Okay, so what, uh, s just quick uh, stuff we did since last NetDev in Montreal, which I have, haven't been there. So there was work from uh, Chris from who who was a uh, coach in uh, Chen Kujiri for helping. So uh, Ronnie also, it was mentioned, just uh, so, so the, the, uh, the insertion rate, uh, there was also um, a, a session here in NetDev by Ronnie. Uh, work to be continued. This is still in the design or architecture stuff. Uh, but the initial work to improve the rate was, uh, as Ronnie mentioned, is in 414, I think, not 413. Uh, so it's in. Um, other stuff which was more internal to our driver is something in 412. I think it was a bit after the conference. So we completed our uh, VXLAN tunnel offload to properly deal with uh, neighbor events. And what I want to talk to you today about is something we call hairpin. Um, you said, you said it's the, uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, herping in switches, is uh, in, in classical switches, herping is, is not very common. Herping is when a switch is willing to return a packet from the port they accept it, which is, by nature, it doesn't look good, but in switches, sometimes they, you have to do that. Also in the early, maybe 10 years ago, we were doing with VEPA and all those models for uh, Ethernet, but uh, in Mellanox uh, hardware, we borrowed uh, this term. So, uh, <laughs> herping in our uh, NIC, it means that when you can, uh, you can forward the packet from port to port. It's not e-switch, not what's uh, discussed before. It's not an uh, abstraction of embedded switch. This is rec a, a NIC. Like you have, t you have two ports and you have a NIC on each of them. So now you can, you can, uh, you can pass a packet from one port to the other port without going to the software. So th this we call it herping, okay? So, uh, from the same port to the same port. Yes, yes, yes. I mentioned that. The, the, the more uh, natural case is uh, from port one to port two, but as a, f as a private case, we can also do it on the same port. Like we can get a packet, do some processing in hardware, and return it back. Okay? And the implementation in, the, in our hardware is by uh, pairing two queues. Like you have a receive queue, and you have a send queue, and you pair them. And after you do this pairing, everything that goes into the receive queue goes immediately. Uh, from this send queue, okay? So let's see what value it can bring. Uh, so first, how do, how do you get to this pair? It, it's flow-based, right? So uh, like TC Flower that we're talking, after, after we, we, we do some matching, we can send this into this pair, okay? So you can, it's not that when you put it into this mode, everything that goes in the port immediately goes to the other port. That would be pretty stupid and not useful. So it's flow-based. So many flows can get into a certain uh, there's a many to one, potentially many to one relations. Ma many flows can get into this herpin, or you can have an herpin per flow, depending on the use case. So, um, how, how do you use that? What's the API? The API is very uh, simple. It's just TC Flower with a mirrored. Jamal, you listen to me? I am listening. <laughs> uh, it <laughs> so, it's uh, TC Flower with mirrored redirect, okay? So, you would, put, uh, you would put a TC rule on port number one, and you say, okay, do this matching, go to port number two. Because these two are NICs, our interpretation of that is that what the application wants here, they want uh, hardware forwarding, and imp we implement it with, uh, with NIC. With NIC. Uh, you can uh, also, in a typical use case, I'll bring some use cases here, a typical use case, just this forwarding for itself is not gonna work. Uh, you, you must do something on the packet, either 
add or drop a VLAN or do NCAP or DCAP or header rewrite of some of them, okay? So uh, other, actions, uh, other actions should be applied to the packet uh, either before you put it into this channel or after you it out of the channel. For example, header rewrite. That's a simple uh, example. Um, so what, what can you do with that? Um, uh, so far, people were using uh, the NIC from Melox or other vendors. Let's say you have a load balancer or you have something. So, so the NIC can do uh, NCAP or DCAP or can do VXLAN or VLAN or can do checksum or can do... If, if the NIC can do 100% uh, of your data pass, uh, so the only missing point to fully do it in hardware is this forwarding, right? Uh, so so um, let's say you have a DDoS gateway. So um, um, you have a certain rules that say what to drop. So you drop 25% and 5% you don't drop. So those 5% so far went through the CPU. Now you can say, you, you can, after the rules, all the rules that put something to drop, you can put a rule in, the, in a lower priority that says pass. Jury, this is something missing in our driver the priority. <laughs> I owe you, <laughs> I know, I know that you know. <laughs> what, what? Yes, I, I, I owe you, uh, sorry, I was busy. Uh, I know in your, I'm on your blacklist. Uh, so, um, so, um, so again, uh, uh, so this is one case, uh, a DDoS or a load balancer that today a load balancer will get the packet, they, uh, they add the VLAN and they send it, or they add the VLAN, they do header rewrite uh, and they send it. So if we can do, we can do the, the VLAN and the header rewrite in hardware and we have herping, we do everything in hardware, okay? Um, CPU stays as practically zero usage, and you have control, and you control uh, for monitoring or Jamal for billing purposes. You can, you have, you know what's the vendor, right? Because you have the flow counters, okay? And uh, hopefully in uh, 416 uh, we'll have it. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Excuse me. Thanks for keeping up the speed. Can you share the flow counters between multiple flows? Yes. Yes. Uh, do you have an idea how, um, um, can TC give us a hint? Yeah, no, in TC, uh, oh, the, yeah. uh, the, 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 yeah. So what's, what's, what? If oh. you share the action and the action has a counter, so if you say accept, for example, or okay. W you mean the, uh, oh, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, you just share if the action. Let's say, let's look on the mirrored redirect. Right. So today we open a counter it, it's implicitly like no one tells us we just do that yeah it has a counter by default uh, then but you can have two rules one match source ipx the other one match source ipy action okay index three so the counter it becomes index three for the counter okay and we there's all the infrastructure for us to offload that exists yeah we know that of, of course it does is yeah. it, the, the, is it exposed know if it is to us in the driver do you, do you know oh we talked I, with gigi but gigi is gone yeah. <laughs> so uh so yes, we should, I'll put it on our, we, we uh, our, our hardware can do that. Hopefully the firmware will support right, that right. and if I not, we'll fix if it. If, yes. if, you have, if your hardware has a structure where you have actually stats as indexed, as a table of where you can Yes, so multiple point. flow can use the same counter. Yes, right. we, we should, uh, we, we, we will support that. All, all other vendors work like that? Like is there a hardware uh, stats table or something? Uh, we do, but we actually, right now, we're not hooking up to TC where you can say index three, right. you know, this counter. It'll be very easy to hook it up, but, you know, we'll have to do it. Yeah, that, that would be very useful for billing if you have a group of people you want to build them for the same thing, for example. But in the example that I gave today, yeah. I only, let's say I don't do any modification, so I have, I have a matching and then the mirrored redirect. Yes. If I want to share the counter, what, what do I have to add? Another action? So by default, the kernel will give you a counter index, which basically an action has an index, so that becomes your counter index. Okay. Today we... Sort of or you, it, you can explicitly say yourself, I want oh, oh, so. counter number 10, index 10, then it's shared. Okay, so we will yeah. reshare that. Okay, that. so I have a question for you. What's the difference between this happy, this where you connect two ports together versus redirect? That's a mirror, right? What do you mean by connect two ports? It's you, uh, here, I brought back this slide here, where you're pairing the queues. No, 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 I, I, again, the... the <laughs> You don't connect, yeah, it's, it's confusing. Yeah. Uh, in Herpin, you have receive on one port and then it's transmit. So right. it's, you don't connect the port. Okay. It goes through the, the NIC uh, ASIC, right? Right, the but I, I, I can control that, right? From TC or from? Yes, it will happen only if you put a TC rule. If not, it's not gonna happen. What is a TC rule? Mirrored? Ah, it's an egress rule on port number one. Right. That has matching and then mirrored to port number two. Okay, okay it's mirrored is the key, okay. 
I, I think what Jamal is saying, it's the same. Only thing is, earlier you did not support, uh, you know, redirect action from uh, uplink port one to uplink port two. Now you will be supporting it. Yes. That's, that's no, but before that, it was, we were dealing only with eSwitch. This is not for eSwitch. This is Nick. Right. Like, okay. It's like you're doing in uh, yeah. in, t in um, U32 or whatever. Right. I, ha I have a question for you. So I didn't get the part. So you are, are not doing any DMA at all? It's all in the hardware? Yes. So what do you mean by queues then? These ah, are hardware queues? You, no, the driver creates the queues, we pair them, and then we let the hardware manage them. We just create them, and then we forget from them. Ah, OK. OK? Yep. And I think what's uh, very nice about that, you can do it from an NFV. So if you have a, like an uh, embedded uh, e switch, uh, open vSwitch which manage the uh, hypervisor, you can still do the, those from the virtual function. Yeah, so if you have an NFV that is running, and want to forward traffic from two ports, he can do that also from a virtual, on a virtual function. Yes, oh, thank you, Ronnie. This is more confusing. I, I forgot to mention that. This last, so it, it, you can, this is done after all, this, all, all your steering, right? So yesterday we were discussing, the, so typically vendor today have three layers of steering because vendor has this multi-host. So initially you have a multi-host switch and then embedded switch right. and then the NIC uh, steering. So you have three levels. So this is done after all levels. Yeah. So you can, do, you can do it if you have a VM that gets a virtual function on each port, we, we allow that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, qu qu one more question. So XDP redirect can do similar things, right? S so do you, do you see this as higher performance than the yeah, XDP? Totally, this is, confused. This is okay. totally in hardware. The packet doesn't go into the CPU. In XDP, it mm -hmm. does, right? It's not over, even over, over the PCI. So I even see. It can be even higher than the PCI bandwidth. Because, because you don't do DMA. Yeah. Yes. OK. okay. Ronnie, you're a good marketing guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it, what Ronnie said that in a certain case, because Nick typically has caches on the ASIC, right? So if, if it happens that all, those, uh, all this stuff is cached, when packets go, they don't go through the PCI. But this is, this is more of a marketing feature because it has to be very, what? I'll have to get all the secret sauce from Ronnie. No, okay. it's not a secret. It's a, it's a, <laughs> I, I just can't, I, I don't, uh, okay. Okay, thanks. So. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Anjali Singhai Jain. Um, uh, the stuff that I'm presenting right now is on behalf of my colleagues. It's uh, not my work, so you know, pardon me if I can't answer a lot of the questions because I don't know the deep dive. I'll try my best. Uh, they couldn't make it here, and that's why I'm presenting it for them. Um. Okay. Did I get? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so uh, this uh, is the work that has already gone uh, into the kernel. Uh, there were some changes that were done uh, to the NQ prior scheduler um, to get some more hardware offload. Uh, I, I just want to point out that the earlier, there was a hardware offload support that was done by John for NQ prior, uh, uh, you know, for the TC offloads. This is just building a little bit more on it. So. Uh, we are offloading, uh, you know, beyond the TC, the queue configuration and bandwidth rate limits uh, into the hardware with this change. Um, and uh, the, so uh, what we did is we added another mode for the MQ Prio Q disk, uh, and uh, we call it the channel mode. Uh, the default mode is DCB, which was, uh, you know, done earlier, and this is what we're calling it the channel mode. Um, we also added a shaper option um, uh, for QS attributes, and what this gives you is a, a configuration for min and max bat bandwidth rate limit per TC. Um, right now, our hardware, uh, I mean, our driver is just exposing the max bandwidth rate limit. Okay, so this slide kind of, uh, you know, describes the command line arguments that are uh, new, that are added, uh, that are getting offloaded. So um, there was already, um, you know, the number of TCs and the uh, priority to TC map kind of stuff that was uh, present 
Um, the new stuff that got added is uh, with the hardware offload, uh, which is on here, hardware offload uh, being one, we added a mode channel and then uh, a new option for a shaper, um, which uh, right now is for bandwidth rate limits. And uh, uh, this one is, uh, you know, it, it kind of describes that you can uh, have the min and max rate. Actually, it's never a min rate, it's the guaranteed rate um, uh, and the max rate. And so I, I think we should change that name instead of the min, it should be the guaranteed. Um, uh, and then um, for now, we are supporting only the max rate offload. Uh, what else? Uh, that kind of shows after you add that rule, you know, the output of it. Uh, this was uh, some cleanup that went in to align, uh, I believe, the MQ and the MQ Prio. Uh, QDisk, where the interpretation of the class ID was, or the layout of it was different. And um, so with this change, uh, you know, we're reserving um, FFE0 to FFEF uh, block for class ID for, um, you know, the hardware TCs for all of the uh, QDisk, uh, whereas uh, 1 to FFDF are for the, the physical QDisk that are mapped to a TXQ. Um, uh, that's pretty much what got changed here. So, okay. You want to show an example? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was, um, we added another action on the ingress classifier. Um, uh, this is basically to forward uh, a, a flow to a given TC uh, rather than to a port or to, um, uh, you know, um, which was which is the mirrored redirect action, but this is this is instead of forwarding it to a interface, it is actually forwarding it to a um, traffic class in in the hardware. Uh, so so th this this part always confused me. So I, I I think so if you go back to your other slide here, that's that's like really nasty syntax. Okay, I've always complained about this, but <laughs> see this thing here, like um, I think this works. Uh -oh. That, that thing there, l l I mean, look at that. What, what is that, <laughs> right? So I am complaining about it, right? <laughs> and, I, I'm so, and people blame me for a lot of this stuff. I had nothing to do with that. I think this is Alex Dyke that did this. Uh-huh. So uh, it's that is danger on the slide. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are? And you didn't have to come right. <laughs> and uh, so now when I see this, well, this is like eye candy, right? Look at that. <laughs> I, it's hardware class number one, right? Yeah, hardware traffic lights one. one, yeah. 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 So yeah, this was done is there any hope to fix the other then. stuff? Or? Uh, yeah. To me, it's very evident. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah I mean, I, if, if I go back, um, basically the, the queue stuff over there, it's number of queues at offset zero, so it's four queues at offset zero, and then another four queues at offset you don't like four. Like <laughs> oh, it's you. Oh, you're, you're taking credit for it? Okay. Yeah. Well, we, can, we can beat up on him. He's here. <laughs> so come on. Move He's in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what is offset? I mean, offset from... Uh, uh, so uh, what, what this is saying is, hmm. say you have eight queues in the hardware, hardware yeah. queues. Right. The first four queues starting at queue zero right. belong to TC zero. Okay, so... And the next four queues starting at... At offset four. No, I, I admit I have used MK Prior, it's very useful, and I, when I was trying to use it, I finally figured this out. It's just, I don't know how a human gets to understand <laughs> this stuff, but okay. But, you know, most of Linux yeah. is that way. I, yeah. I sometimes think it's what's not yeah. written by humans. By uh, going and watching, uh, I had to, you watch you Fastwind giving a. Yeah, I had to go back and watch uh, John's uh, uh, presentations on it and read through his slides to f figure it out. He has a really well written man page for it, Jamal. You should read it. Uh, the, the man page was okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we, we use uh, MQ Prio for uh, the, the TSN stuff too to direct to traffic classes. Yeah. Yes. If you use Livat. I mean, that thing is another piece of, okay. 
Okay, so I'm going to move forward. So yeah, so this is the addition on the ingress uh, classifier, which is uh, basically uh, you know match on uh, the example here is match on destination IP X and UDP port Y, and skip the software, add the rule in the hardware, and direct it to TC1, and then um, when it's in TC1, and we kind of talked about TC1 has four queues, and then you know uh, RSS uh, is used to kind of pick the right queue. So. I think, I think it would be really nice if there was a diagram actually showing the stuff. Uh, it would be Hello. It would have been nice because y most people don't understand this. Uh, when you say HWTC, mm -hmm. they think it's a queue, but actually it's a class of Class of queues, right? yeah. Yeah, so that's a good feedback. I'll probably add a slide and yeah. send the update slides to you. Okay, so the next work that I'm talking about is uh, uh, future extensions that we want to do uh, uh, to TC. Uh, uh, this work is with my colleague Manasi. She's actually watching us right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, what we want to do is we, are, we want to be able to program the hardware TCAM using TC. Uh, the kind of things that the hardware TCAM can do is your longest prefix match and your range matches uh, for like say ports or whatever. Um, so uh, what um, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, recently, uh, and I don't know who added it, but recently somebody added the priority field uh, for uh, that we can use for the ACL offload. So if you're doing the longest prefix, prefix match, you basically have to give a hint to the hardware uh, which one is the highest priority rule, so it puts it in the right order in the TCAM, and that priority will help us do that, uh, so that you put like the highest resolved rule on top, and then lower resolution rules at the bottom, so that... So, so the uh, TC already pr supports priorities, right? Yeah, is yeah. you're saying when you said update, it means your hardware or the infrastructure? Yeah, so, so now we will pass that information uh, down okay. into the driver so okay. that we can interpret it um, uh, okay. and ap apply the rule correctly in the hardware. Okay. Uh, and then um, we, um, the usage for adding uh, these hooks is for firewall offload and for V-router offloads that heavily use LPM. TL decrements and stuff like that, right? With p-edit, maybe. Uh, sure, uh, maybe not in. Maybe what not. We have right now. <laughs> and we, uh, range matches are what exactly? Something in the middle of. Yeah. So uh, I have an example. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, the range matches, right? So there are uh, two ways to look at it. Um, uh, I'll go with the lower one. It's easier to read. So the port ranges, right? So you basically want to match. Uh, you you have a single rule, which says if destination port is in any range, 105 to 802, any random range, you basically have some action redirect or drop or whatever. So that's, and I think the, oh, the syntax is wrong on the lower one. I haven't fixed it. Uh, so uh, that's the range match that we want to do. And so we will have to make a little change. And I think you're okay with that, Jamal? Yeah. Okay. And the one that is on top, which is for uh, which doesn't really require any changes other than that when we do the skip software, we get the priority in, in the driver. You, so what do you think of that? Sure. Sure. Uh, what? Do you have some patches? I would like to definitely see that. Uh, <laughs> another maybe three months or so. Okay. I'm just curious how you, how you are going to do the ranges. The yeah, so l l me first. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think you, 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 you'll need to, uh, it depends if it's a power of two or not. No, you, may, so you may get away with one mask or you may need two. Uh, yeah. Some control planes just use mask. They play with bit fields, so they, get, they manage to avoid ranges and use some. Uh, yes, and it's very, it would be very natural. For, for, for instance, OVS, they don't use range, they would use. Uh, they would they I know, but, but like the Contrail V router doesn't use mask. They want to use a range. The so Contrail? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, so I mean. No, it, it, it's definitely a useful human uh, interface. 
makes a lot of sense to see that then right I just one thing. You, you 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 colored the IP and the mask in the higher but the mask exists. It just maybe doesn't exist in TC tool, but the kernel API supports that. Yeah, yeah. No, it I, also that's, exists in this, excuse why, me. That's <laughs> why I, mar I marked in a different color. The red is for what doesn't exist. Oh, so you know that the and, mask exists. Excuse the, me. Uh -huh. The purple one exists. I, we're just going to use it in a way that you could supply an IP address match with different mask per rule. You can do that. Yes, of course, you can do that today. I, I know that in software you can do that. In hardware. Uh, you can't do it, so now you can offload that in the hardware, I'm where you can have a different mask. Can you do that on Melanox with different masks? Uh, yes. So for do any, a sorry, no, 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 not a wildcard, a range, right? Which is no, no, yeah. we're talking about the mask. The first one. Yes. You, you you need a TCAM for that. No. Okay. Oh, they're clever. They don't want to tell you how they're doing <laughs> okay. it. Just keep going. Keep going. So you, you support a mask per rule, even if it's the same packet type. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So no, we we don't support it. We will be supporting this. Uh, you know, starting our next product. So. Okay. So that's pretty much what we have. Thank you. No, that, that's it. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Thanks. Okay, hi. So I'm Ariel Elior. I work for KVM and I maintain the QED QED drivers and also the BNX2X drivers. Um, but this is about QED and QED. And we recently added um, Mac VLAN and TC offload. Uh, and specifically, the, like the, the problem statement and the use case we were working on was in a container environment, although that's just uh, really the motivation. Um, so we're trying to route traffic to specific containers based on the flow. And so we're using our 25G uh, four port device. Um, and the requirements that we were trying to achieve for that uh, problem was uh, 15 million packets per second on small packets across all flows, so no caching. Um, and we're looking to get 15K uh, flow arrival rate and 16 million flows and VLAN uh, push pop swap. Other vendors, is that those numbers? Look, look at the numbers. Do you, do you guys think uh, they're within your reasonable range? 16 million flows. 15 million packets per second. Yeah. Yeah. So prob uh, I mean, if, if I'm not mistaken, so the the PPS is pretty li is, is no problem for, I think for most vendors and the higher end NICs. Um, the flow arrival rate is actually so one you had a whole presentation on that right. So I, the real problem is the kernel right, and the, it's not the hardware right. So hardware can can go much faster than that. Uh, and 60 million is probably a good number, I think, um, compared to most vendors. Um, okay, so let's go for it. Um, so uh, I guess everybody knows this, the, the non-offload flow, uh, the packet will have to traverse a lot of uh, stages until it reaches the, um, uh, basically the container, right? So we're, we're going through a Mac VLAN to represent us in the, in the container. And with non-offload flow, um, numbers were very poor. Uh, 1.6 megapackets per second, um, and the flow arrival rate was 4K per sec. This is not without any offload, right? And with offload, so we're able to reach 17.2 um, megapackets per second. The flow arrival rate was still limited basically by the kernel, and I think we might have been working just prior to the fixes that uh, Roni was describing in his session, so we're still being limited by the kernel. Uh, to 4K. When we tried like hacking around that and seeing just how fast we could go, so we could go to like half a million per second um, if we uh, knew which flows we're going to do and just did it from the hardware at a go. That's the speed we could reach. So we could definitely benefit from what you guys did, and we're actually also looking forward to the future work you were describing on offloading millions of flows a second. Right, that's relevant for us. Uh, 
All right. So a little bit on the syntax. I think uh, we've, we've all seen a lot of syntax here, and there's no, I, I'm not presenting anything new, right? Just uh, what I was using. So redirecting, uh, in this case, according to a destination IP address um, to reach a specific Mac VLAN offload device. So maybe I'll say just uh, another sentence, sentence of that just to explain what, what I'm doing. Um, so we're, we, off, we implemented TC offload and Mac VLAN offload. So we'll have a, a target device to um, redirect the traffic to. And so how many Mac VLANs can you offload? Do you so, remember? Or? So, so the limit there is the amount of queues in the okay. device. So and we've tested, I think so far we've tested with uh, 128. Yep. yep. Right. Yes. Let's, let's uh, listen to Ariel. So because I'm going to ask you the same question. Right. So, right. You, uh, see, I'm going to do the same thing to you. Are you listening or? <laughs> okay. I'll repeat so, for all. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so how many are so you? I'll, re I'll retransmit, right. Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> so I was saying that in the solution here, we're creating offloaded Mac VLAN devices mm -hmm. to be our representers, right? The, the, the um, net devices we are redirecting the traffic to. Okay? okay no, uh, this is the Docker presenter. This is a non switch, this is a non -switch model. The correct. Switching is done by Mac VLAN. Yeah. Give me hardware. Can we give you it, It's being done in hardware. Yes, but this is this is this model does not use switching uh, with, rep, with switch ports. There's no switch ports here. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, so Jamal was asking how many we could do. So yeah. uh, I think right now the number is 128. 100, 128. Are you using SRIOV or something for these, or yeah. okay. why is it 128? I, I also have the same problem with I40E, by the way. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I it 768. So you just go shopping here, right? No, no. <laughs> so I basically, this is limited I want to the amount to know of what's going queues. on, right? So <laughs> this is basically limited to the amount of queues, right? The, the amount of queues yeah. that you could do, and right now it's okay. 128. And actually, I think we could probably push that. Uh, we can do more. Five twelve. Um, okay. Uh, and but, but okay, keep going. I'm sorry. Okay, pay attention. Okay. Um, right. So that's the syntax. A uh, little bit. Sorry, yeah. The rule? First you okay. So, first I think you see ETH tool and not uh, TC? The, what's the question? You're using ETH tool? No, no. The, those are... Ah, to now, okay, so, so, but when you're using TC, yeah. when you want to have to drop traffic from specific uh, Mac VLAN, how can you do that? So that would be a different action, right? So, so here, what I'm doing here is redirecting all the traffic that has a very specific destination IP to the Mac VLAN. Okay, and when you want to do the opposite? So that would be a different rule, right? To no, but how, how you can mention, you will mention from the Mac VLAN? No, so all of the configuration is being done on the base device, right? The Mac VLANs are the uh, targets. Okay, the so computer. that's what actually, you receive a traffic. When actually, you that's block. a very good question because typically Mac VLANs, sorry, Mac VLANs, you don't, uh, it's based on Mac address. Uh, Fasterbend is just sitting there tweeting or something. Fasterbend, yes. right? Do you need to uh, pay attention? Yeah, pay attention, please. Okay. Uh, so the question is, Mac VLANs. Ha basically, it's based on the Mac, and you can optionally provide a VLAN, correct? It's not uh, you select just certain things. So, so. Okay. Uh, so. The, the way Mac VLANs work is they have a Mac, so they have an L2 Mac. You can um, receive traffic or transmit traffic, and when you transmit traffic, it should probably have the L2 Mac that's assigned to the net device. But nothing stops the hardware from forwarding any traffic it wants to those net devices. I see you mean it gives the, the, the hardware doesn't care. You put a TC f flow rule, use TC and program the hardware, or use flow director and program the hardware, and it'll put whatever traffic uh, you filter on it into that uh, Mac. And as long as your system can handle that, it should work. It, it just looks counterintuitive, right? Because uh, typically, I would create a Mac VLAN. I'll give it an IP address. Apps go out. Magically, things just show up on that. If, if, I, if I move, move the, contain, uh, the Mac VLAN to a container, right? Right, so, th so that would work here, right? It, that, uh, that's the same thing, or you, or you hear you? The, what's, what the, what? Mac VLAN interface is just a virtual interface, just like right. a VF or a PF. Yes. And he's adding a TC rule on top of that Mac VLAN interface. Right, but 
What I mean is typically a mark, you create a Mac VLAN, then you move it to a container. That's, that's the use case normally I you have. And then I, I would go in the container and attach an IP address to, the, to the, what shows up there. Uh, and then I would add rules inside the container for specific uh, uh, traffic, not to redirect to a Mac VLAN, but maybe I'll drop or I'll account. Th so th this looked uh, different from what I'm used to. But you're talking about a Mac VLAN offload device? Yes. Right, so uh, w when you're, re when you're uh, adding the IP, you already get the redirect automatically, that's what you're saying? The tr traffic just starts appear appearing there? Yeah, because ARPs will go out. Uh, and right. and, and so this and is like an explicit redirection, right? Okay, uh, all right. It's, all right. I, I don't want to distract this. It's, I'm, I'm supposed to be the timekeeper, not. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Yeah. Sorry. If I may. Uh, so, um, you said that you don't have any representers. So, if you have this Mac VLAN uh, device and you put it to, uh, to the container, how can you add this rule? So this rule is configured prior, right, before the... Uh, That's not good. So that was the requirement for this uh, project, right? That's what they wanted. Uh, so you, you configure a rule, you use that device, which after disappears from... Right, but... Yeah. Well, so yeah, that, this is what was done. Yeah, that's, yeah. Th that's, why, that's why I think this is really wrong. Like. So, so this would be good b if you're not putting it in the container, right? If you're just right. creating the Mac VLAN device on the yes, yes. But hypervisor, I guess. But, st uh, but still it's wrong because it doesn't work for all the use cases. So yes, the, the transmit side is not working because you can't specify that's from specific Mac VLAN. You want just to allow s to drop specific traffic. You, you don't want to allow for Mac VLAN 5 to send HTTP packets. So, so you want to have an ability to configure it, is what you're saying? Yeah. Right. Yeah, th that's, the, that's the reason why we, we don't want to extend it. We want to, to go to another model, so like you, the SRV you, you model. So the plan is to kill Mac VLAN? Is that the consensus? No, not to kill, but yeah. not to extend. Ah. So I love Mac VLAN. Right, but this is not an extension. I just want more of them. Right. We're not killing Mac VLAN. Right. So in that case, would you accelerate your VETH pair, or you would actually accelerate your Mac VLAN? That's you, you uh, could have accelerated your VETH pair, right? Then you get right, the representer. So, so it, if you had a representer. So, so one half of the VETH, what one half of the VETH is in is yeah. basically hanging off the hardware, and the other is going to be in the container. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm, I I just haven't seen that use case. I know that his his customer wanted this, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. This is John, it's for you, but don't you agree that what Jerry uh, pointed out, it's, it's if, you, if you set a rule and then the device disappears, it's, it's, not, it's not good. What do you mean? But, it's, it, but it, you would get the same thing on a VF if you, if you uh, configure the rule on the VF. No, the rule is the representer. There's no. No, at some point, Intel tried to do rule to a VF and maybe it gets in, but it was a, a, it's wrong that Dave didn't knock that. No, but you could... But but I'm not sure it's correct to let someone offload it in their driver if it's wrong. Okay, so now I'm, I'm the timekeeper now. Let's move on. Okay. So be that as it may, uh, a little bit of lessons learned uh, from our experience in implementing these two offloads. From so for the Mac VLAN offload, um, most of what we've done was refactor the load and unload flows. Um, adding some ifs there and whether we are now doing, so we're using the same load flow when we're creating a Mac VLAN device, but um, uh, a limited parts of it, somewhat similar to what we've already have for VFs and PFs, right? That it's the same load flow, doing things a little bit different, so now uh, one more mode for that uh, flow. So all in all, it was a, a rather easy uh, offload to implement. Uh, a couple of things that um, we, we noticed and I'd like to supply feedback on is one is the RX mode classification uh, NDO, which basically has a generic implementation in the Mac VLAN device to call the base device, right? The base device that gets the call with the RX classification, but there is no indication there anymore that this has been called on behalf of one of a forwarding device, right? It looks and feels to the base device just like RX mode classification. So this looks like something that's missing. So th th we know that this is an 
uh, RxML classification that's being applied to a specific Mac VLAN device. And one other point is <coughs> that if you want to get your statistics on a Mac VLAN offload device, you need to sort of explicitly call uh, Mac VLAN count Rx on each uh, packet being received. And basically, you're not making any use of the hardware statistics. Right? So if there was a way to do that in the, for a Mac VLAN device to have a callback into the driver to supply the statistics instead of having to explicitly increment them per packet, that could probably be good. Um, and FastPath had like almost zero changes. Uh, only we only had to. Um, you, the only difference is that you no longer uh, know which net device you're going to, out of, just out of having the queue. You need to f to because the queues now be might belong to different devices, right? Some queues belong to this Mac VLAN device, some queues to another. So you need to be careful about how you're doing your references there, not to hurt your performance. Uh, so maybe more interesting uh, lessons learned in implementing uh, TC offload. So we had a lot of uh, fear about the syntax, but actually the, the dissector and the built-ins were very useful and was actually very easy. Um, uh, once we had the net device um, that we were being configuring to for a Mac VLAN or a VF, uh, actually we, we did that as well, although uh, maybe that's, the, you know, this is not representer-based, just a VF device-based. So we traveled the forwarding device devices that we've created and found the the right one. Um, and we implemented a few uh, actions, the mirror redirect, drop, and VLAN push pop swap. Um, and they were working well for us. A little bit about statistics. So today's hardware has, uh, we have per flow statistics, but only a limited amount, a few thousand. So they can work as buckets, right? I can, uh, you were talking about that before, Jamal. Um, Per flow, I can decide which bucket it goes into, but if, if I want a different statistic counter per flow, I, can, I only have thousands of such buckets. Right? I, if, if I get the, that next flow that I don't have a specific counter for, I can either not count for it or assign it to be counted with other flows in, okay. in buckets. Yeah, that's it. So you have one, any more slides? Or? Uh, there, is, there is a little bit more, uh, just a little bit. Uh, I do have per action counters in the hardware. Um, and I was wondering a little bit about uh, hardware offload sort of assist uh, for statistics here because uh, hardware can indicate per packet which flow it belongs to. Okay, so if the TC non-offload, um, basically I could implement in driver a millions, uh, count, uh, millions of counters and get a hint from the uh, device on which flow was it that the counter should be incremented for, right? We could, we could build that. Uh, but I was wondering if that makes sense uh, and sounds reasonable to, to okay. get. Ari, I'm going to wrap you up here because we may, you have any more slides or? Um, so okay. this is the last one. Okay. Um, so what's ahead, adding some more actions. Um, and on our next hardware for n uh, next year, we'll be adding uh, wild cards and reclassifications. I guess that ties into the multi-chain uh, and better, like full statistics in the hardware. Okay, uh, no questions, please. But he, I, I wish we had like a whole day to go over this, but uh, I think it's you know people. The whole point is for people to sit and talk as well. So talk to Ariel after that. Thanks. I think there's a need for us to have a way of testing the control plane of offloads without having all the hardware. And um, I looked at adding stuff to the dummy driver, but I don't feel like that's the right way to go. And I think most people agree with me. So we'll probably invent a new driver. Or maybe someone has another suggestion. I was thinking about adding it to Rocker, but that doesn't seem like a great fit either. So do people understand? Uh, people who are, I don't know who you've talked to, but... Just to clarify that I got you right, it's not that you want to uh, test TC and software. You want to test the, the, the hardware offload infrastructure? Right. So For instance, example, like what? The, the skip software flag? What do you want to No, do? like Jiri added now the, the blocks, right? And then now like we don't really know how to use them. It would be cool if there was like a software implementation of how it's supposed to like, like what's the expected way of hardware to making use of it? And also implement your 
kind of like your offload model for, for all the classifiers and then you can run a self-test in the kernel without the hardware to see if anything so breaks. So what's wrong with Rocker? Rocker has a no, key no, 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 new... No, no, no. Rocker is something completely different. Rocker is driver for existing hardware. The hardware is uh, in QEMU, but it doesn't really matter. What we, what we really need is something like uh, wireless guys, they uh, have the it's, uh, HW SIM. You, did you heard about it? It's basically, it, uh, it works like you, you can configure, you, you, can, you can see the device, but this, there's no real device. You can put a lot of configuration and any, everything. And what I, what I think we can do is something like that. And also uh, you, would, you would see the outputs about what was pushed down from the from the kernel stack to the driver, you could see that uh, in debugfs or whatever. Right. So I know that Rocker is uh, is a certain hardware model because because it's virtual, you can extend it, and it already it's there in QMU. Why not? Right, but why not to to use QMU? any other driver? That's the same thing. Why not to use MLX MLX5 for that? No, because Rocker can be used by anyone and can also can do packet processing. Right, yeah, but, but you need QMU, and then if you run, just want to run a self-test, like in the kernel self-test, like it's it's yeah. a hassle. I well, it, it also it would be good to have like some uh, some test suite which you can run, and you can see actually that no uh, no inter uh, no 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 API within uh, the kernel is broken, uh, something like that. Yeah, it, it would be nice. And yeah, the next question is if we had the driver, then what's the interface to configure it? And uh, you suggested debugfs. I that should be a good fit, right? I don't know. You that mentioned it. So that no, no, not to configure it, but to, but to see what's going on inside. Right? right, but you also want to like tell it to reject something, like you know, so you you test the reject, so you want to say right. like now reject everything right. and you install the rule. Yeah, yeah, that's the question. I, I I'm, I think that it's a good idea, but I don't really know how to implement this particular API. The rest is. Quite right. easy, but this I don't know about it. So would, would it not be like vendor specific templates, maybe? Or what do you mean? Well, NFP, for example, may not behave the same way as MLX five. Right, but most of the stuff is kind of shared. Like, how do you offload flower? Most people have in, like a, the cookie, and then there is a hash table, and then you insert something in the hash table, program the hardware, and like fetch the statistics. Like, it's it's mostly co like there's a big chunk of it that's common mm -hmm. to everyone, and but not everyone like understand it's when they ch change TC and then you change TC and the hardware offloads kind of break. Right. Yeah, I think that what Jamal suggests is, is like uh, to have some f s some list of capabilities which you can set on this uh, simulated device so you actually can say hey this supports BPA, this supports flower, oh, okay. but it doesn't support DU32 or something right, like that. Right, right, so okay, now that makes or, or sense. Or you could say something like, you know, I can only do 8K rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. then if we have automated yeah. tests that Try to do more than 8K. At yeah, least yeah. It gets there's the limit. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Any so other uh, Nick vendor area? What do you think of this idea? You like it? Or you have no comment? Okay, who's who's another? Uh, who else is a Nick vendor around here? Not you, Pablo. No. Okay. Kapil? <laughs> um, oh, Michael. Right. Sorry. Yeah, so, so basically it's just for, for testing purposes, right? Right. Yeah. Only for testing. Yeah. yeah. It's so so uh, uh, like a test driver? Yeah. 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 Right. Mm -hmm. Testing and maybe also like a, the, like a blueprint implementation so you see how the APIs usually work because like most mm -hmm. people just look at another driver but most of the drivers are not perfect. Right. So like it would be a simple way of, of describing what's the like usual way of using the APIs as well. So, so for example, you would do the VF representers, the, the way that should be done. Right. And then the... Um, uh, switch ID, parent ID, and all that, that in a standard way, naming right. and all that in a standard yes. way. Yes, yeah. okay. that's, okay. yeah. that's a good, good idea. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think there is actually the SRIV stuff. W didn't someone do some dummy driver? Right, it's on dummy right now. There's actually dummy driver extension to make it try to test for SRIV. It's kind of a weird thing. Yeah. You haven't seen that? Uh, yeah. Somebody from Red Hat, I think, did it. So would the intent also be to maybe make a this a unit test framework to what, what test framework? to kind of validate yeah. so this is something called TDC we're doing now. Okay. I don't know if people think TDC will be the right test case. TDC is quite limited. I, I wanted to uh, uh, include the test test for the for the chains, for the multi chains. Yeah, it was not really yeah, yeah. possible to do that at all. 
<laughs> yeah, we already exchanged a couple of emails. <laughs> right now we have some very simple tests. It will run like TC commands, and it, we expect something to come back. So I'm, ex I'm thinking that, you know, if you... Uh, that's what I think. Right. I mean, you should be able to say, just offload this to hardware, and the dummy driver will say, will accept or reject, right? Would it skip software, right? Yeah, also you you need to monitor you need to monitor what's happening inside. Like if the if the insertion of a filter rule really got down to the driver, you need to monitor it. That's so how, that's but, a purpose. But that that is a general problem, right? I mean, I don't know. Shrijit keeps complaining that we don't do that. That's what he was complaining on his talk that we add rules to the hardware, netlink messages back to the soft to the uh, user space. But you're not quite sure if it succeeded or not. That's why we need this. Okay. I guess. Th you're, you're thinking this, this has. This is, this, is this is like for for testing the, the the kernel internals only, not the drivers of the vendors themselves, right? That's. Yeah. So so to me, I mean, the value of this TDC thing, and I'm hoping. I think probably that's your point. You broke something you're using, correct? And uh, if this te if this thing existed, you would have caught it. Is that am I correct? So he would have caught it, not you. I break something all the time, sir. No, I know. <laughs> That's the name of the game, man. We break things all the time. So <laughs> as long as we fix them, right? right. Is, that, is that your main point, uh, that, that you're motivating this? Yeah, that's, that's one point. Okay, that's but one of the points. Also, the, the, like the how to use the APIs, because we often just add APIs. Every vendor adds an, like, an API. Right. I think Jui has the same problem with SwitchDev right now. Like We need to really describe what the API means and how it's supposed to do, because they're by reading the driver code, so that's another thing. But the testing is primary use case. Okay. I, 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 what did you say? It, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, if someone comes in and wants to, wants, to, wants to write a driver and use these features, he looks at other drivers. Exactly. Definitely. Like, there's no other way. So yeah. why not to have like some driver which is readable? Right, and yeah, it doesn't have, hopefully, bugs. Go for it. <laughs> okay, I, I, we, we don't want to keep you up. He has to go upstairs, actually. He has a presentation. Okay. But uh, is that uh, something we can maybe, uh, unfortunately, the conference is over, but maybe we should have had this session yesterday. We could have been mailing list discussion, private, right. or mm -hmm. dev or how do you want to take it next? The only decision I think we should make uh, is sh what the API is for. And like who's going to write it? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to write it for XDP, like the XDP offload, because okay. I think it's useful for that. Right. But it, yeah. Are we using debugfs for setting the bits? Uh, let's discuss it on, on, the, okay. on the mailing list. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jakob. Okay. So what I'm actually going to present here was um, not my work. <laughs> um, this was done by one of my coworkers, Brenda, who um, um, who is very, very fluent in Python and uh, was able to put this together a lot more quickly than I ever could have. So um, what she's already actually already done a first round of um, uh, patch submissions, which uh, she withdrew and we're actually going to start resending them um, because um, unfortunately there were a couple of changes that uh, Chris introduced as part of the um, uh, Sorry? Chris Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, he introduced a feature that's in the script that is going to prevent us from being able to um, put all the plugins just yet because we have to support um, what he just added, which is the ability to skip test cases. Uh, so in any case, what, uh, what she's added is basically a series of hooks uh, that can be run at the various phases. So um, hmm? okay, I just want to close the door. People familiar with this TDC thing, uh, how, it, how it works? Anybody? Uh, Yuri, I know you are. But anybody else know, has looked at it? Yeah, you don't. Well, Alex, it. yeah. <laughs> okay. I, would, I would hope. Okay. I don't know if we have time, but maybe. Okay. Um, probably not, but. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a test utility. F it's a testing utility for command line interfaces such as the TC executable. Um, it could be used for the IP command. For we're actually using it for our own CLI at Mojitatu. So um, 
And it's designed more for things where you uh, craft a message, send it off across some sort of bus, receive a response. So you're not directly connected to the, the end piece that you're influencing. So you, you, know, you do a, a write command. Basically, you set something, you create something, you delete. Um, then you go back and verify. So that's the whole principle behind, behind this here. Which is via the, what the response you get back as well as the exit codes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I discovered as I, well, what I submitted originally, it is, it, it is extremely limited. I, I confess that. Um, so Brenda added the ability to create pl uh, plugins. So what you can do is you can actually customize um, customize your running environment. So probably the best way I can demonstrate this is to look at a couple of that she already wrote that were basically original TDC functionality. Oh. All right, so one of the original features of TDC, or features, um, was that uh, it would do a check to see if you had root privilege privileges before attempting to run anything because obviously all your tests were going to fail otherwise. So what she did instead was using one of the hooks, um, which is before the pre-suite, or sorry, before the test suite begins, Oh, that's, oh, that's the NS, sorry, that's the NS plugin. Yep. There we go. Pretty sweet. So literally, this command right here was uh, in the TDC mainline script. So what she's doing instead now is uh, um, putting it in the pre-suite hook so when TDC runs it's going to check um, whatever's linked in along the way and then it's going to run that command so if you have this particular uh, plugin linked in then it will actually do that check for you before it runs okay. so something a little more complicated um, is the one that we were just looking at which is the namespace plugin. So I had everything configured to run inside a network namespace so that all of the wonderful TC commands that you would run would actually not pollute your host namespace and potentially mess up your system along the way. So this has been stripped out. So example here, uh, pre-suite, we're actually going to create the namespace. Uh, sorry, that's a function call within the file itself. We're going to create it. We're going to create the uh, dummy devices, or actually the VEth that we're using to test things against. Uh, migrate them in the container. This is basically everything that I had in the original TDC script. Uh, same with the destroy, okay, uh, which is called from the post suite phase. Okay. There we go. It's going to be initially a pre suite plugins that will be invoked. Yep. Then you run your test. Yep. Then you run a post suite plugins. Yep. Depending on there are six define uh, six defined phases and then one that can run at pretty much any point. Uh, so there's pre and post suite, uh, pre and post case, and pre and post execution. So if you need to manipulate your environment in any any way, shape, or form, you just create the code to run. Uh, inside the plugin at the appropriate phase. And that uh, suit your needs, or you think it's going to be it's missing something? Uh, it's an, th this is sufficient? Oh, okay. I have to, I have to my hands yeah, yeah. So, did she submit these patches already? or? Uh, no, no, not yet. She could did the original 15 patch submission, and now yeah, yeah. it's just. Maybe, maybe what you could do is 
someone like Yuri was interested, you could give him ahead of time. Mm -hmm. You could pass them to Yuri or, and then slowly submit them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have something you can show? Like an, sorry, I'm just trying, gonna try. Uh, you had 15 minutes, but I don't think uh, it's now three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, do you, is there something exciting that you could show, like a test? Um, I don't know if I would call it exciting because yeah. the the end result of this is, you know, it's going to run exactly the same way as it did before. <laughs> Maybe or uh, yeah. yeah. So, is this going to help me to work with more than two net devices? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yes. Um, because what you'll be able to do is, uh, as part of your, say, pre-suite setup in your plugin, um, you can actually go and create, or create another um, virtual device, or uh, migrate. I, I, I'm sorry, I actually did try making uh, Chris's changes into their own plugin, but um, it won't be compatible with the current state of the script, um, mostly because we don't have the ability to skip yet. Um, Actually, I can show you a little bit of code there. Um, in the NS plugin, you created two ports. Why is that? I mean, okay. Uh, the ETH with a pair. Okay, you had Dev one and Dev two. Okay, so Dev one. Okay, well, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So this was my this was my attempt to duplicate what Chris was doing. Um, so in this case, taking an actual physical device and migrating it into the container. So as long as you have, um, wow. There we go. If you create a sim link inside the plugins folder to whatever you want, then only the ones that are linked in will run at, the, at that particular time. And ideally, what you'd want to do is uh, you know, number them as well, like loading order. So you'd want, uh, say you want to use the existing namespace plugin. Uh, you would number it, say, 10, and then the one that migrates the hardware into the container, number that 20. <laughs> so that they run in the correct order, otherwise it'll fail it. So. Okay. Uh, sorry, dude, I'm gonna cut yep. you out. No, that's yeah. fine. I've done Kay. what I needed to do. Okay, so we don't wanna use LNST for, we wanna use a different system? Complementary. Yeah. It's complementary? Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can use both actually. This is for the Th th this is this is mainly for uh, uh, like testing on one single host, right? You run the test on one single host. This test, yeah. right? So we're not we're not um, testing effects just yet. We're yeah, just so configuration. But can we can we do it somehow that let's say I have a test for TC actions uh, for I've, I have I have a test for flyers, flower thousand types of uh, matches and another thousand types of actions. Can I use the same base? stuff in LNST and then in, I can put it in both you systems? Mean like a configuration? No, I mean, c could, it, could it be made that uh, we have uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, I'm asking you because well I don't you know. Can, you can run TDC from, uh, from within LNST, that's not a, not a problem. That's what we intend to do. No, but let's say we, we want to, uh, we also talk to vendor. we want to have, you know, uh, start to have testing to, to verification of, let's say, flower with matches and actions and stuff like that, but we don't want to write well, this is just uh, to, to to see if the command is working. That's it, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so e exactly. So, for example, the la two weeks ago, Lucas caught uh, uh, Yuri uh, Kong Wong submitted a patch to yeah. fix. Yeah, it kind of crashed. So, yeah. if he had a test, he just ran it, and within one hour, he was posting to him saying something crashed. And I think I just saw him revert the patch, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Uh, Alex is uh, adding yet another enhancement to TDC, or he is. This is a proposal. Uh, when you, just to see if your filters are being hit or not, 
So you just inject packets into the egress, or if you're using something like Tantap, you can do it on the ingress, and you then you list your rules to see, yeah, it got hit, right? I'm just trying to save time so he doesn't spend too much time here. Okay. Yeah, um, hi. I didn't uh, integrate the uh, stuff right now in TDC, but uh, I want to show the, the basic idea what I uh, want to do. For example, this is, uh, um, I make a VE interface on my local machine with a peer in a, and separate them in a namespace. And uh, then the inside the namespace, I uh, set up here the, um, the IFE action with a reclassifier. IFE is, uh, for example, I have a, a Wireshark running here with already some captured IFE Ethernet pack, uh, frames. For example, here you have the Ethernet and then the type is uh, the forces type, that's the IFE stuff, and they have the metadata. We have the, I, um, the IFE action can insert or pass metadata like the SKB mark or SKB bio, TC index, and... When, when did you write this? Uh, you wrote a Wireshark plugin? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I For did IFE? <laughs> okay. I did it uh, yeah. while I fly to okay. the conference. Okay. And then um, <laughs> this is uh, the outer Ethernet um, header, and then you have an inner Ethernet header, and then with a uh, reclassifier, then um, it puts the Ethernet header out and then pass the inner Ethernet header and um, make the action drop. It's just an example with the U32 and it match on a IP protocol and uh, on a ICMP packet. So, and yeah, what I have. Action does, it's, uh, it, it's uh, to carry metadata on the wire. So you can actually say SKB mark can be carried from one machine to another. What he's trying to do, I think, is uh, he's gonna, he's also doing fuzzy testing. So it's more than what I thought. He's basically injecting some bad packets into the yeah. into the egress. Yeah, that's what uh, Scappy is made for to um, make uh, also fuzzy. Yeah, because um, what the kernel uh, makes is um, it passes the TLB fields, which you can see on the on the Wireshark. Here you have the metadata length, which is the whole length of the um, ether. Uh, Ethernet payload in this outer Ethernet frame, and um, then you have the TLVs in a list. And for example, what is when the length is different than the payload value here? And then we can show um, test this that the, the parser in the kernel works. So um, that's the scappy code. It looks in the at the moment, ugly, and they have some. They have some special, um, special classes which you can inherit from packet, for example, and then you you can uh, specify the fields like the type. Type is a short field which is only two bytes and so on. This is, but this you don't need to care about it. Maybe I put it upstream to. Scappy, this is still in development, and Scappy um, accept p uh, pull request on uh, GitHub, so we can maybe um, put the whole TC packet generation also into Scappy for the Linux kernel. And uh, what we can do is easily build some packets. That's, for example, uh, uh, the outer Ethernet header, and then um, the IFE data, IFE data I described here because I want to replace it several times. Here I have IFE with the TLVs in a list, SKB mark uh, 17 and SKB bio 10, and uh, then we have the inner Ethernet header with the IP and ICMP which hits the TC action, and when I 
I have some scripts here because I'm new in this sub subsystem. We can see right now that uh, here is the droplet uh, counter of 45, and when I just send it without um, making a, a, a TC rule uh, to build the packet in, inside the user space, and then I think in the background it makes a RF packet raw socket and send it to the other um, VE's interface. And then we can see it also on the on Wireshark, and then um, what we can do is, yeah, in in this special case, I want to see if the drop counter is incremented, and then the test is passed when uh, it's incremented and hit the rule. And uh, what you can also do is, for example, what I described before is, um, for example, you can make uh, lengths override some default language, uh, values. So this is very scappy specific. Each non-default value uh, will be uh, yeah, when, when I type, for example, fast, oops, <laughs> and this and then uh, each value which is not calculated by Scappy um, will be um, will be in some random, um, will be uh, end in some uh, random value. Then we can check again. I messed it up. So, <laughs> okay, here, uh, so uh, um, yeah, but this is the idea to, yeah. I think it will also work because the, the length value is, uh, I, I know my mistake. About 10 seconds. Yeah, uh, the length value is a calculated uh, value, that's why um, fast will not work, but uh, I, I will make some test case. No? Okay, so, but I think the general idea, I think you guys got the general idea. One is he wants to inject packets so that you can test your classifiers. You know, is your classifier going to be hit? Is your action going to be hit? The meaning of the packet is not that important. But the things like IFE, which construct packets to send out, because they take, it, they take the metadata and they, make, they put it on the wire. Uh, fuzzy testing is good in case you're not checking for boundaries. It, it will crash the kernel, <laughs> basically. So uh, most of the, probably it will crash the kernel. Um, so thanks, Alex. OK. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Prem Janalgad. I'm an uh, engineer turned uh, product manager at uh, Barefoot Networks. Um, I think this talk is um, focused on how we could map P4 programming language to TC and then take it to a P4 programmable switch. So all this talk is after the packet has left the server. It's all what's happening in the in the cloud over there. So just a quick overview of P4, uh, what it contains. So P4 contains uh, you know these four high-level uh, components basically. So there's the language spec, which describes what the P4 language is, and then there's a core library which has functions that are independent of the language, but the language can use. So this is like the standard library in C. And then at the bottom, you see multiple copies of the architecture.p4 and architecture library.p4. These are target-specific descriptions. Uh, so if you have a, a hardware switch that is p4 programmable, you can have that hardware switch.p4 describing the architecture of that switch. 
and then associated library for that particular switch. Um, I mean, all the details are in the P4 spec. Uh, there's links to it at the end, but this is a high-level description of what P4 is. It's a high-level domain-specific uh, programming language. So one of the target architectures is called prot protocol-independent switch architecture. It kind of looks like this. There's a programmable parser in the front of the pipeline, and then a series of match action units, and then followed by a programmable deparser. So the parser itself, once the packet comes into the switch, extracts all the, the header details based on which headers you described in your P4 program, and then kind of puts them into this metadata bus. So for every packet, all the headers are extracted, put into a metadata bus, and that metadata bus is accessible by the match action units. So the match action units can you know, take information from the metadata bus, look up tables, and do some actions. And then once you've done all of that through your series of match action units, at the end, the packet has to be reconstructed. So it'll take the new headers from the metadata bus, constructs the new packet, sends it out. It's a very simple architecture, um, and uh, this is what uh, Tofino, our chip, is based on. So now, how do you map a P4 program to this uh, PISA architecture? Kind of looks like this. There's a parser program that kind of maps to the parser in the front. It's essentially a state machine built using the headers that you've described. So after you extract Ethernet header, you know, based on um, ether type, you can extract you know, following protocols and so on. So that state machine is described in the parser. And then the match action units basically use the header uh, fields and then perform the match actions. And that is kind of uh, described using the tables and the control flow. So the tables and the control flow essentially decide which lookups ha happen first, and what actions do you perform, and then out goes the packet. So in Tofino, I'm gonna talk about Tofino a little bit later, but in Tofino we have two instantiations of this uh, pipeline. Um, logically, I should cl clarify. Um, so you have the parser, match action units, and the deparser followed by a traffic manager which does like queuing, scheduling, um, you know, uh, replication, multicast, and all that stuff. And then there's uh, again a parser, match action units, and the deparser. So when a packet comes in on the ingress, it kind of goes from there all the way to the end. Depending on the number of actions you need to perform and number of uh, uh, lookups you need to do, you may not use what's in egress, or you may only use part of the ingress, but you have all the, all the stages available to you. And it's programmatically uh, described using P4, how these match action units perform the matches and actions. So an interesting discussion um, related to this pipeline diagram is like, how does this relate to the TC pipeline? So TC pipeline is much richer, has more functions in it, but there are parts of it that can map to this PISA pipeline, and you can use, you know, you can use uh, offload mechanisms to offload to this uh, hardware target. So that is, that is the, the whole crux of this talk, and uh, trying to figure out what is the, what is the, the best thing to do here. So, so that's essentially, um, you know, what, what we're, we're looking for. How do we map uh, the TC pipeline onto the Tofino pipeline so you can actually offload some of the use cases for TC onto Tofino or any other switch, right? So this is a very simplistic view of how the flow would look, but you would have a, you know, a P4 program. Um, think of it as a P4 program that's describing a use case that was achieved using TC, and you compile that P4 program, and now you can generate the TC rules, and you can use the skip software flag to push those TC rules 
to the hardware. And what happens is the same P4 program is running in the switch as a binary. So now you, TC has uh, a hardware representation of its pipeline in the switch. And then you can use the you know, APIs to populate those tables and uh, basically you know, put in all the information that is required for packets uh, to be looked up and switched when they come into the switch and go out. So essentially, you're doing what TC does in software, but in hardware, um, and at much higher performance. Any questions so far? Yeah. yeah. Why you want to skip software? So that that puts the the entry in both. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, it could be a choice, I think. It's yeah, yeah. To you. It is Maybe. a choice. I think what I was highlighting here is more of a, a complete hardware offload uh, mechanism. But that's a good point, actually. Um, you can put it in both. Yeah. So, um, in case you are talking uh, about full hardware offload, yeah. Uh, I don't understand why you. Why you have the other arrow from the the bottom arrow from the compiler to the oh. before switch? This is v kind of confusing good. to me. Yeah, very good. I actually sent an updated slide. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, I did. Sorry. <laughs> while <laughs> while this was going on, okay. but uh, hopefully uh, you know when the slides get posted, that will be there. So this the bottom line that's going to P4 switch is the actual compiled P4 binary, right? So um, it depending Sorry. depending on how the P4 program is written, maybe you don't need this bottom line because you've already loaded the switch with a particular instantiation of uh, P4, and TC is just mapping. But this is assuming that this switch is clean, like uh, in the case of Tofino, uh, it doesn't know. I mean, it doesn't know anything until you load a P4 program. So, but isn't it similar? Uh Jury to, to what we have with BPF, with TC BPF, the, in there they also they have you have a TCP program that you want to. Yeah, but you push the program uh, through the TC. And here it's not applicable to do so. I it doesn't look like it. No, why why not? Shouldn't we do it in the same way it's done with if BPF? It's not that trivial. You would have you essentially have to yeah you would essentially have to have. Uh, Interpreter of P4 inside TC, basically. And, and, and why you need that, right? If you know the draft, if you can translate the P4 program into. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can translate, let's assume that you can translate the P4 program into two TC rules, right? right? It is all about right, that. Right. So if you have now, if, if you can know how to offload TC, yeah. then you don't need anything. Right, uh, but that but is any binary. true. That is true if the switch already knows how to offload TC process. in general. Right. So yes. this would be maybe good for Mellanox because we already have. Let's say yeah. you translate from P4 to TC, and we know how no, to. No, but, 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 uh, but we asking. Uh, the question is, what is the right way? Right. Yeah. Now? Right. So so sure. Sure. So. Yeah. <laughs> What what you can perhaps do is, uh -huh. and I, I was suggesting it already. Uh -huh. You can have the compiler within the within the driver, so yeah. it gets the rules. Yes, it compiles the actual binary for your particular hardware. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if that's you, possible, you can have it in the firmware yeah. somehow. I don't. Yeah. I, don't know. yeah. I see. I see. So we could use the same mechanism. I mean, the the only thing here is. The switch doesn't know how to process packets until you load the binary. Yeah. So I, I, I guess I'm not sure I followed. What, what about the control path then? What happens? How do you control this thing from? How do you? So that's what you need to control. If, if uh, something like when you deploy OVS, so they're dependent on the slow pass. So your switch cannot support slow pass where there are no P4. You cannot, uh, you, can. you cannot flash it with a default uh, something that will. We, we can. Yeah. So I mean, if the if the packet comes in and the switch doesn't know what to do, we can always punt it up to uh, kernel. Yeah. Slow path. Yeah. So the updated uh, picture will be a little bit more clear, but <laughs> this is. Uh, so this uh, is uh, uh, Prem. So yeah. now let's say we we follow this suggestion you're making that he's going to generate TC and just do a uh, install the binary. How does he then control? 
I see. And how do I do uh, get a dump? How do I do a dump of something that's in the P4 hardware? In this, in the Tofino, the switch. Dump from the, from the out of the pipeline? I want to just let's say get stats or something like that. How do I connect? Is is, it, is the translation in TC or callback? Yeah. Okay. So so to me this looks pretty straightforward for things like polices or flower classify. If that's what's supported. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, would yeah. Is that how you see it? Like you know, flower will be offloaded to P4. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think if yeah. <laughs> well, as long as I can still use the same AP tools, right? right? It's not just some property blob which bypasses the Linux altogether. Uh, yeah, I think this is the idea, but to, to use TC, right? Uh? This is the idea to use TC, not to use some blob. Right, right. To use so some existing yeah. uh, But if I, if I understood what Yeri is suggesting, he's saying basically take the P4 program. Generate your binary blob for your hardware, in put it into your hardware. Huh? No, I think what Jerry is uh, suggesting is this line yeah. goes from the compiler to here. It goes from here to here. Yeah. So, sorry, Mike, 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 Mr. F <laughs> I was trying to avoid getting on the mic. Uh, the, the problem with this is P4 is, is way more flexible than TC at this point. In terms of the, 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 terms yes, of programmatic, yes. what you're yeah. programming. Because yes. you're programming something completely different. TC is yeah. programming runtime configuration of existing True. TCAMs in the offload case. True. Here you're like, you are actually generating the TCAMs, the CAM, the parse table, ah, all of these fields from the P4. I mean. I, I, from a model perspective, I don't know what your yeah. search actually does, but yeah. from a P4 program, you might just create some arbitrary parse graph, some arbitrary table layout. Yeah. You might have your own template, yes. right? And you might have multiple pipelines. Correct. Uh, to add all of this, uh, so there's two pieces. TC is only runtime configuration, right? Uh -huh. It's not the actual instantiation of the hardware. True. So you, I still think you want to have you're going to load some firmware blob to do that. Right. It's unlikely that you're going to have TC come and say, create TCAM, create TCAM, uh, here's a create parse graph, add yeah. action, add action, add action. I mean, like that doesn't make a lot of sense. Essentially, you'll context. put a lot of the logic here yeah, yeah. in here if you do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. At some point, so TC is no longer TC anymore. It's, it's no, like it's hardware generation engine. So the, that's why I was asking. If for fixed functions, like if I know it's a police. It's I, I think what, you, what you're saying makes sense, but I yeah. think what you're saying, and let me see if this is, try to repeat this. Right. You're saying they should generate a P4 program that matches what TC can do, and then they'll be able to support all or, TC offloads. Or go, go and write some like new that's code, a, the TC code. Right. Well, then, so yeah. then you go, oh, I want to have a new TC action. I'll go write TC code, yeah. and then I'll yes. rewrite yeah. my P4 program so that yeah. it supports maybe, maybe that TC action. Maybe their compiler is smart enough to generate TC code. But this is, uh, this you is fine. That's one model. It's yeah. quite a bit less flexible than the, the, the sort of vision of P4, which is that I don't have to recompile my kernel. I don't have to recompile any of my programs. I'm going to auto-generate the user space. And I'm going to auto-generate the kernel, the hardware, and they're going to just magically talk to each other yeah. because I've generated everything in P4. And, and that's one model, but it's not the model that seems to fit very well into TC. So do, do you see that, uh, for example, I, I don't know, Prem, what mm -hmm. you guys have, but what if you generated the action uh, kernel code? <laughs> yes, but, how do you, but then um, this depends. Now, now, sure, you can generate the kernel code. Yes, that's possible. Mm -hmm. But now the question is, it's not upstream, right? Because you're not going to upstream everybody's yeah. P individual P4 programs and load their modules. So True. I mean, this is part of the problem with one of the, I shouldn't say problems, because it's different problem spaces. Like exactly. you're, you're solving different spaces. Right, right. But like, you know, Flower solves as like has a match fields for a tons of uh, fields, right? And you can add them as you need them, which works fairly well as long as you don't have something like P4 on the backside making up arbitrary protocol formats, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you don't want to go into Flower every time some random person writes up a protocol that doesn't make any sense to anyone, but they're a very specific use case, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you could perhaps do it in U32, just the parser block, though, again, right? Like, yeah. so it, it, I, I'm not sure. So, so basically, for fixed functions, it's fine, but for the but power the, that P4 I has, I think you yeah. So, like, even if, like if I in P4, I can basically write an action in C, yeah. C-like language, right? right? So, I might decide I want to have an action that, uh, you know, ands random bits in the 
byte stream of packets and then mask them off based on some field in the header and you know right. like you can do and then appends it to the front. So my, my question like, to you though is in regards to this not being upstream, how is this different from eBPF? There's a lot of stuff that gets injected into it. So now, now we have to talk about context. So like yeah. eBPF is, is, is instructions, like, like it's an instruction set. Mm -hmm. P4 is not an instruction set, yeah. right? And so when you compile it, you, you compile it into most likely Other microcode, target, yeah. but that microcode is not an instruction set that's run on an embedded core. It's, it's I'm speculating some, some but it, it's yeah. somehow generating the actual, uh, like um, I've seen this on an FPGA, for example, it generates the Verilog and the Verilog gets loaded, right? Yeah. Um, in their case, it probably configures TCAMs and arranges data paths on the right. ASIC somehow. Yeah, we, we essentially generate a binary that uh, so just yeah, goes So you basically in. have to stop the switch or something and then oh, load it. Oh, of course, it. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, yeah. doubt you can reprogram this live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's a little bit of a you know, blip, but yeah. yeah. I, so, that, I mean, the other model would be like P4 program that, I mean, it would be, I think one interesting thing that would be to do is if you, if you had a P4 program that represented Linux mm -hmm. and it, all like that was the sort of Linux. You could even yeah. put it in the P4 source in the upstream P4 place right. and say, "Hey, if you want to have a switch that matches what the Linux capabilities are, then you run this P4 program, and now every possible Linux offload will start working for you, right?" And that might be a valid model. So I'm saying that the next talk is more something like that, like not coming with an all new pipeline, like. Expressing the current pipeline and, and maybe extending it a little bit. Okay, uh, Mari, is this uh, you? Because you're next, and I'm trying to be a timekeeper here. But okay, is this uh, is this still within your theme? I haven't looked at your slides. Oh, or right. your, your slides. You also gonna you wanted to talk about P4 as well? Yeah, right. right. So he w he is getting greedy. He wants to show another slide. Is that? No, it's just a quick slide. Okay. <laughs> I'm it's just thinking that we had that time allocated for P4, and Yuri gave up his time because he said he presented initially to show what TC can already do, like in terms of blocks and chains. Okay, so, um, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been spending a bit of time looking at P4, I think it would be easier to map it to the NF tables. Okay. Yeah, we can take a look at it. <laughs> okay. Do you have a slide you want to show? Yeah, it's not very much. Hmm? Okay. okay. Anyway, so uh, yeah, it's not very much. Yeah. No, well, well, we're waiting for that. Um, yeah. Where's John? He left. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Uh, in theory, if this was to, uh, if someone was to take his compiler because it generates the data path code, and generate a Linux kernel module, which is an action. I, 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 from my perspective, when I, when I look at this thing, I have not, I'm not, I haven't really looked deeply, but it looks like the classifier seems to be very simple in their case. It's just one, it parses. It's not unlike TC where you have, can have many types of classifiers, right? You can only have one here, which looks at headers. Yeah, so it, the, the only thing that changes is is the actions, right? No, I mean uh, the, the parser is, is programmed via a DSL. So you have a domain specific language and you define the parser. The parser can be anything you want, but I mean, and if you're just asking, is it a parse graph? Yes, because that's usually how people do parse. I mean, that's what parsers right, are. Right. But, but actually in the latest P4, that's not even true. The parse graph itself can have actions inter nodes. It, it, it's quite complex. Yeah. I mean, so, they, like, so, right. I mean, that big slide will actually show that. I mean, I couldn't get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, in the other slide, what I was showing is you could potentially have a TC architecture .p4 program. So that kind of describes the TC architecture, and then you have your my TC app .p4. I, I think that's probably the best. I mean, that's yeah. the easiest, obvious, right. easiest answer to the problem is right. build a, build a um, what are they called? I've already forgotten. Architecture. Architecture. Target build architecture. an architecture file yeah. for the Linux TC, right. and then define the pieces that people can reprogram, which are probably yeah. just very simple things. So on you the define parser. this, which yeah. becomes a TC architecture and then a certain library for TC, and yeah. then your P4 program maps nicely to it. And it's a pretty simple single TCAM thing yeah. with a basic parser block in the front. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, it can be multiple TCAMs. Do you, yeah. the, how do you, does Flower have support for multiple TCAMs now? Multiple Okay, yeah. yeah. Cool. So, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Fair enough. Okay, are there any more slides, uh, Prem? No, I think the, the rest are just... Okay, know, people can download and read yeah. that after. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I, yep. Yep. Cool. Thanks. Same topic. Um, we started with different approach, so so let's understand first the use case. Why we need what we are, why we are talking about P P4 offload? Oh, sorry, why we, why we are talking about programmability in general? So P4 is an, a language, uh, eBPF is another one. Um, so in general, uh, what we see we see uh, the old world which was around fixed pipeline, uh, fixed functionality. Um, defined by ITF, IEEE, uh, then um, people start to talk about what, so, and it was usually uh, fixed software as well. You b buy a software from uh, a box from Cisco Arista, one of those v uh, vendors, uh, you got f uh, 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 fixed functionality out, out of that uh, boxes, and then um, People start talking about white boxes and ability to install your own software, come up with innovation in the network. Uh, so second stage, after you put some, your BGP, some, some customized BGP protocol or SPF or whatever protocol, then maybe we would like to put some fun, uh, flexibility in the pipeline itself, in the hardware itself. So again, so there was uh, uh, kind of like like what Prem uh, was presented, we you can come up with a P4 program that describes the full pipeline, reinventing your pipeline. But what we think is actually, this is in most cases what we see, it is not what customer like to do. In most cases, what we see is that customer want to take the existing pipeline, which has layer two, layer three, BGP, and add some flexibility to that pipeline. Uh, so, and this is the, what we call the real world. So in the real world, we have the ITF and the IEEE within the switch, and we, we want to add some flexibility to that. And actually, if you look at, so now let's look at before as a, as, as a language that can uh, help us doing, uh, achieving that goal. So actually, if we look at the migration from, and, and the movement with, from P4, 16 to 14 to 16, sorry, this was exactly, uh, uh, this matched our idea. So. In P414, there was a, 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 a big chunk of pipeline with some ingress pipe and egress pipe, which is totally different with what we, we have in Linux, right? In Linux, you have a discrete model of a layer two, layer three, and then you may have another layer two. Each, each, each part of this pipeline has ingress and egress model. In the bridge, you have ingress and egress, and then in the router, you have ingress and egress, and then in the switch afterwards, you have ingress and egress. Um, so it is not like P414, but P416 give you the ability to define a target, and in that target you define the pipeline, and each one of the pieces in the pipeline is programmable. Uh, and what you would like to do, it's come up with the target which is the Linux target. And the motivation actually to come, to come up with that is that we are trying to solve two problems, not one. One, the first is to give the user flexibility. Second is to come up with a uniform API, meaning that when one user wrote an application on top of that, then the user shouldn't care what is the underlying hardware, whether it is, came from Metanox or it came from Barefoot. It should behave the same. So what we want to come up with is, is the Linux target. And this is in high level, in very high level, how the Linux target look like. So in the Linux, we have ports, we have bridges, we have router, we have tunnels, we have blah, 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 existing pipeline, existing, uh, in the Linux, and what we would like to do now to define the points in that pipeline that we can, we can do flex. We can inject a P4 program. It can be a single table, multiple table, whatever, a full pipeline. Um, and if you look at it, on do, all, all, those, all, all, all those flex points, it looks like that well, we actually we have TC on all those TC injection in all those ports. We have QDisk in all those points. So maybe we can use TC as an infrastructure, as a framework, in order to uh, uh, 
configure the device and the, and, and the kernel uh, with what we would like to do with in, in the P4 program. So in this, is the, this is the idea. So the idea is to have a switch or software switch, whatever. It, it, it can be offloaded to order or just a Linux. Uh, on top of it, we can run FRR or OVS or GoBGP, whatever the, the legacy protocol are running on the, on the, on, on the legacy uh, API, that's fine. It, it will keep, uh, it will stay run. Uh, it, will, it will run the same. Then we can run a P4 program. So P4 program in P4.16, it, it is aimed for one, uh, a, a single flexibility block within the pipeline, within the, within the target. So now you can define, um, let's take the telemetry as an example. Uh, you can now implement in situ or a version, a customized version of invent telemetry, whatever you would like, adding some header into the, uh, into the packet, um, express that in P4, then compile it in to TC. Uh, so what you will get, you will get a P4, Kind of P4 API, you will talk about what should be the API to the application. You can run now your application on top of that API. That, that application will configure those API, whether those are P4 runtime or others, which will be translated into the, into the, uh, into TCN configured uh, uh, to the kernel. And then, and because we have TC offload within the kernel, then it will be offloaded into the device and if the device, your device supports, supports that, you will have it running in the hardware. So no, not everything is cool. So for example, editing the parsing graph is, 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 is an open question. I don't know, I, I don't know how, how we can do that because it is not related only to the match action or to the, the, what you can match and do as a result in TC. It actually affects the, the way the packet look like. So if, for example, you are putting something between layer two and layer three, now you need to learn to teach the kernel that now the IP should become, should, should be in different place. And you need to parse the IP from different place within the packet. I don't know, I, I don't have the answer for that. It is more like a brainstorm, uh, this presentation. Local, no, it is not like we have a solution and uh, this is what we'd like to do. And the same for what should be the API. So P4 runtime API may be a good candidate, but no sure. So, so if, if you have okay. any input or... So uh, actually what wasn't clear to me, so you have, uh, from your slides, you had egress block and ingress, correct? And it seems like there's some scheduling, like, which would be equivalent to queue disks, essentially. Both of the ingress and the egress, and they both have queues. Am I miss missing something? So, right here, you're showing just one. This could be either ingress or egress. No, no, this is, this is exactly, so okay. I'm, I'm not talking about ingress and egress. I'm okay, so each, this flex each, thing. Each one of those block yeah. is in, as an ingress and ingress. Right, but uh, from what he was showing, I could see that they're scheduling both of the input. There's queues, unless those queues are something else. And mm -hmm. on the egress, there's queues also. So this is, this is the funeral architecture. I'm, talking, I'm, I'm, I'm describing now Linux architecture and for, uh, so, uh, I missed the beginning, but I'm trying to understand. So, you're talking about, at runtime, changing the parser in the hardware through P4 runtime. Is that what you're talking about? And how meaningful is that, right? Like, if you inject new packet types, right. wouldn't that be something that even the kernel would have to know about those packet types? Of course, right? of course. That's what you're talking about. Again, this, this is the problem I don't know. I really don't know how to solve currently. So maybe the best way to, 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 to go is to start without editing the, editing the parser, just ability to create those flex points, assuming that the parser is uh, the Linux parser, and later on come up with a solution how we can edit the parser. Whether, whether you can do it in runtime or, or not, it depends on, on, on uh, the target or your support. Uh, in Metalux, we can do that in, par in runtime. You don't, the, uh, we can actually come up with a new program in runtime and load it into the uh, working device. Um, but again, this is up to the target. So uh, John had brought up this earlier as well about changing the parser. I mean, that applies only for something like eBPF, which can interpret a new protocol, but doesn't apply to the kernel. Why? I mean, for the kernel, if you... Uh, 
It is on. Hello? Okay, why? No, the <laughs> okay, so, I mean, I'll take an example, right? Like, in, uh, in the kernel, right now, when you have to add a support for a particular protocol, unless that support is there, you don't really, that's an unknown type of packet, right? And you can't really do anything further with it. Yeah, you can. Right, so I mean, so the packet will come in. It has some header that behind the Ethernet that the OS doesn't know about. Right. You can run XTP and you can match on it, or you could run TC and match on it. Um, the stack will still do it. It'll just not, I mean, it won't be able to, say, run the layer three routing on some made up protocol, but that also, that operation also doesn't have any make much sense either, right? Like, like you, the stack won't crash if you put headers in the middle of the packet, right? I, I, I mean, if it does, it's a bug, right? Because <laughs> we have no control over what people are sending us. Yeah, uh, sure, it wouldn't crash, but it has, what I'm trying to understand, it has no meaning other than for your eBPF program. Or your TC CLS, uh, U32 program, or your TC CLS BPF right. program, so, 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 or... So, so I guess the challenge here is... Or your you VM want, that you, it gets You want this to. block to, 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 keep, to be to be functional as well. So you can define the parser here. Sure. And now we, you want this block to be functional as well. Yeah. And that block right? is You don't what? want to replace all the, the existing pipeline, the router now with the new one. It, it, it is an option, but this is the, this is the easy one. Sh this is the hard one. I want okay. to put some new parser here. Yeah. You know what? I even I don't want to do any match, new match action. Just yeah. to define a new parser yeah. and let the legacy bridge and router deal with it. But that'll, that'll work, right? I mean, why wouldn't it w work? So what, what is this new parser? You're just parsing headers, right? Are you parsing things like, you know, you look deep into the packet and no, no, parse HTTP strings or? I, I can define a new packet format. Be so between layer two and layer three, I put something, some blob. Right. And actually, I, I, this blob is well defined in, in I, I, I create a new parsing graph. So I, d I put some telemetry header right after the layer two. Uh, and then after that, you have the IP header. That, that shouldn't be a problem because the, the parser essentially is not uh, in a single place on the very beginning of the pipeline. It's yep. in the middle. Like all, all, of those, all of these blocks have a uh, parser of themselves in, in Linux. So cool. So again, we, this is the target. So if we, Jiri, we can, if we, we have a, a, a solution that we can come up with, it, that's amazing. Again, that's, that's nice. But this is the idea, this is what, uh, uh, what we are trying to do. We are trying to be able to uh, define the parser, then make both the a new, newly created match action or the legacy uh, pipeline to work. So Mandy, uh, quick uh, clarifying question. Um, so this pipeline that you're showing here is uh, how you're mapping the Linux pipeline? It or? is the Linux, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm or is it uh, the hardware pipeline? No, no, I'm have? saying the opposite. Okay. So okay, I, I want to, to expose Linux pipeline and then offload it. And then offload it, yeah. okay. So you're defining the Linux forwarding pipeline, yeah. actually. So yeah, in, this in is a very high level, not true, uh, true, true, true. So in that but context, uh, so this parser and deparser, that is something that you're just adding on top of existing Linux uh, pipeline, or? So um, the reason that it is in red. In red, yeah. I, I don't know the, 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 okay. the full answer for that. So I can tell you uh, the initial thought was that you, you, you will have a w ability to, to get the, the current Linux parsing graph, and then you can yeah. edit it and put, it. put some node, okay. new nodes, new. So, uh, okay. so I, I had this, I think, working at one point on some hardware where the, you could modify the parser. And then the U32 classifier would try to offload anything you put into U32 mm -hmm. into the hardware, um, which we already have the hooks for. Um, when you can define whatever you like in U32, and if your firmware can then understand what the U32 code is, it can match on it. Mm -hmm. And this, this pretty much works. The U32 is sort of complicated, but... <laughs> Not an understatement. So moving to the next one, how this compiler will look like. So there will be a front end which is actually come from p4.org. The, uh, uh, the front end will do the, all the synthetic and se uh, semantic check for the p4 program. Uh, then the, we should have some mid end which will translate the p4 into TC layer and a bunch of API. Like, 
So again, uh, let's 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 call those API the P4 runtime API. So and now the backend will take the the TC and offload it uh, using switch dev into the target and uh, and and now uh, you have a working hardware that actually uh, offload the pipeline you just define in P4 and Linux. So it is like hybrid. Yes, is it, is it the last one? Yeah, it is the last one. I guess that's all. Agreeing? <laughs> I think at a high level, there's definitely agreement, right? I think details will matter, but um, the concept concept is uh, is is the same. I mean, you're there's multiple ways of looking at it. One is like, what is the Linux pipeline, and how do you map it to hardware? Um, and then the second thing is like looking at an existing hardware pipeline and say, how can I map it to Linux pipeline? So, so there's two different views, but uh, achieving the same goal, basically. Well, I, yeah. I agree. I agree. And just in terms of status and where we are, uh, so currently what we have, we have um, a compiler from P4. Again, P4.16, same concept. Uh, uh, multiple. Uh, F we have the uh, working pipeline, which look like uh, the Linux. Then we can have insertion point into the, this pipeline. And we have a compiler. We first we wrote the compiler to, to our proprietary SDK. Later on, we are going to extend it to TC. And this this is this should be an open source. We should. This is something I would I would be glad to get a community around it. And you know, if you are willing to 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 be active with us on that, so to in order to to write this mid end. So so the general idea is we start with something simple like this first before because your hardware is very flexible. I think that's. Um, so, so, so the idea is to start to, to, to so have some baby step and add some flexibility. And actually, we have a, a real use case from customer that this kind of flexibility will help them expressing the pipeline. Manny, what do other people think, Yuri? Yeah, well, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to start from, uh, from the beginning, right? <laughs> from the baby steps. Uh, we are missing some things. Uh, I mean, uh, as Mati described, there has to be some, uh, some hooks. We have actually two hooks now. Uh, that is uh, before the bridge and after the bridge. Uh, we have to perhaps we need to add another hooks uh, before the bridge and, uh, and the router. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, yeah, we are missing a couple of things in TC, uh, of course, like the like the block sharing. It it will be there. It will be there. Yeah, in a week. So. Uh, then we are missing the, the hinting I was describing. Like the, we, we need to hint the, the parser what to parse, right? Before before other uh, user adds the, the filters. Uh, so. Uh, Okay, to be honest with you, I was totally anti P4 before, but it seems like there's maybe there's a need, right? So, uh, and uh, looks like there's a fit, yeah. right? So you've bitten me to death, I think, maybe. So, um, well, yeah. th there are just a couple of steps that are needed for TC to 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 support the initial phase of P4 adoption. Right. So. Uh, we we can do that and let's see what happens after well, that. I guess let's start. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully next net that we will have something working and then we can come up with some missing stuff, adding them. Yeah. Continue from that. Okay. So there is a plan basically. You guys are gonna. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any objection? Comment. John. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks. So nothing. Very concrete here, but um, PBR is PBR is policy-based routing. Um, let me, okay, policy-based routing. What it means is on a match, you can redirect a uh, packet to an interface, a next hop, an ECMP next hop, or a WRF. And today you can do it with IP rules. Um, not all of them are possible, but uh, IP rules allows you to point to another table and you as an indirection and that table you could have a rule to do whatever you want 
but uh, there are some issues with it, uh, which are obviously fixable in IP rules. You can, you, today you have to burn a table for every such policy decision, which won't scale. And we also use tables, routing tables for works. So there is a lot of uh, management in user space that you'll have to do for this. Um, IP rule scale might be a problem, but I don't, I don't have numbers and I have nothing to say about that right now, but um, it does not have an offload API yet, but I know Mellanox has some for switched up uh, if needed. Okay, why does, uh, why am I talking about PBR with TC? So uh, this came up uh, because if you are installing rules via TC and uh, PBR is also usually hardware offloaded using ACLs, the same thing, uh, TC rules with ACL and PBR with ACL, it'll be nice to have a single offload API to do both of those offloads. And that's where this thought came into picture. Like I said, nothing's concrete, it's just that we were evaluating all possible options. Um, okay. And uh, yesterday I was at a talk by Ronnie um, uh, on contract. Uh, contract offload or contract action via TC. And that's, this, uh, the same reasons apply here too. Uh, Netfilter has all the hooks, write hooks uh, for routing. TC today has only an e ingress and an egress hook. It'll be nice to have a, uh, a routing hook um, if needed, especially if we want to bring in all the other uh, ACLs in the same, in the TC framework. So the contract uh, talk was really interesting. Um, and I think there are other targets which redirect TC tag actions that redirect to NetFilter. So the possible options here, um, one, one suggestion was to actually have a TC action to route the packet directly, that is have an action actually do an IP route lookup in the particular table and uh, exactly as how you do, uh, IP, how IP rules would do. But then this would only work at ingress. Egress is a bit too late. You've already resolved everything you had to resolve at an L3 level. But in most cases, most deployment cases, ingress, that is forwarding, uh, a policy routing for forwarding traffic is good enough. So this is one option. The second option, which I played around with a little bit, is to have an TC action to attach policy um, route policy to the SKB in via desk metadata, which we do in several places. Um, you have a new type of desk metadata to carry the routing policy decision, which can be looked at at the real fib lookup point where the actual IP rules is applied today. So um, I did have some problem, I've not gone back and looked at it in detail, but the problem is we evaluate the desk metadata too early before it reach the FIB, reaches the FIB lookup or FIB rules point. So that could be a problem. I've not tried to find a solution for it. Um, the third, um, a new TC hook at the routing level. I'm not sure if that is uh, feasible, but something if, if another use case comes along to uh, do the same might be useful. Or leverage an existing NetFilter hook like you do for contract with something. So those are the three options, not played with all of them, but um, yeah, if anybody has any suggestions, that'll be useful. I'm just take, I'm using this forum to just uh, discuss this for future. So the other challenges that uh, we have brought up on the mailing list a few uh, weeks back is global PBR rules are usually global rules. Uh, they are not tied to an interface. For example, an example rule would be on any packets, packet that match the source IP, route it to uh, redirect to a particular routing table or redirect to a particular WERF and so on. So we don't even need WERF per interface stats for this. Um, NetFilter does allow uh, adding global rules. I know uh, we talked about shared blocks that Jiri has on the list. Uh, that could be useful, but I had a few questions. Um, I will look at your slides. 
Um, so with shared, do we still have rules tied to every interface? Do we still have stats for every interface is the question. No? It's shared. All is shared. All is shared. Even stats are shared. Yeah. OK. That's pretty nice. So that, that will help. Are those in? I, the patches are in? No, 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 not, yet. not yet. I, I probably won't won't make it to uh, until the, the merge window will open. So after that, to mm. the next cycle. Nice next cycle. Okay. Okay, that's all I had. I'll save you some time, Jamal. To uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe let's pull it offline and see all those guys that are not here for us before they. Okay. Uh, let's give them a chance maybe to prepare and so a, break yeah. for, a break for me. <laughs> so I have some okay. slides to prepare as well. Yeah, so I, wanted, I was curious, are you guys thinking about PBR in any way, offload? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Using IP rules or TC, have you guys given it a thought? Mm -hmm. TC? Okay. So does this fit into your other diagram that you showed? There's the flex in different areas. Of course, of course. Okay. Part of it is PBL. Yes. So okay. he, he had, uh, you saw his presentation? Yeah, just now. Okay. Yeah. Maybe we can have it offline. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thank you, thank Rupa. You. So we, I only have, so two, are these two gifts for us here? I only have two gifts. I don't know, there's a lot of people who spoke. Who hasn't got one of these yet? Uh, okay. Well. I really didn't get one? Okay. Yeah. S I know you got one, right? Uh, I don't know, is this for the next session or for us? Okay, you're on, you have one. Michael? Where's Michael? He left? He left his phone? Uh, whose phone is this? There's a big Samsung phone here. Okay, it's mine now. Okay, well, thank you, everybody.